Welcome to the Wednesday, April 6, 2022 Garrison Board of Education workshop meeting. Uh, Dusty, will you call the roll, please? Jocelyn Apicello. Here. David Gelber. Here. Madeline Julian. Excused. Courtney McCarthy. Here. Kent Schott. Here. Matthew Spicer. Here. Sarah Tormey. Here. All right. Pledge of Allegiance is next. of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Next up we have accept agenda, agenda changes. Do I have any proposed agenda changes this evening from the board? Be resolved that the Board of Education of the Garrison Union Free School District hereby accept the agenda as presented. May I have a motion, please? Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Nays, abstentions. Thank you. We will now move on to the board presentation part of this evening, and we will begin with a capital project update from um, Calgary Construction to go along with our sound effects. Hello, okay. Wanna introduce yourself for? Sure. I'm Eric Wilson from Calgary Construction, and we're the project managers for this project that's been happening since last summer, and it's gonna be winding up in this September. So um, we haven't been here for a little while. We've had a lot going on, so I'm happy to update you guys on the progress, and any point you wanna stop me with questions, go ahead. Oh, I'm blocking the slide, Mike? Okay, now I'm done. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead, Dusty. All right, so right now we finished renovations areas one, two, and three, the elementary school area and classes 28, 30, 31, and also the front area, which is, includes the new nurse's office. So the, the whole back area has been done, one, two, and three. We'll show you a, a drawing in a second. And now currently we've done the demolition work in the art and collaboration room. We're getting the new construction. And then next, um, next week during spring break, we're gonna be doing abatement and further demolition in that area. So all the remaining abatement that we have on schedule in contract is happening this next week. We could still discover more, but everything we know about is going to be dealt with by next week. And as you can hear, oh, too fast. As you can hear, the middle school um, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning work is ahead of schedule. This is work that was planned to happen during the summer, which, as you can hear, I'm sorry, is happening right now. Um, that means the demolition is it's taking place to get new heating, ventilating, and air conditioning in the entire middle school wing. So that's going to be underway. They're going to be working next week on it. So some point in late April, um, we're hoping that's going to be online and able to be used. So that's way ahead of where we were planning. Um, now go ahead. So this is the drawing. Area one was the red area. Area two is the yellow. And then we moved into area three, which is the blue. And all those areas now are substantially complete. And there's only remaining punch list work. So small items of correction that are still being dealt with in those areas. The nurse's office is finished, but there's some casework which is still missing. Some of her cabinets are not quite there, and some need to be swapped out. But that'll be happening over the summer. She can, she's using it right now. Nurse Melissa's in there, and the space is working fairly well, I think. Um, the library is still a storage space for the remaining casework, most of which is going into the art area and the collaboration room area, which is in orange down at the bottom. So that's the area that's under construction right now is the orange area. And that's on schedule for March into April. It should be winding up probably by the end of April, maybe the first week of May, but it's right on track right now. Go ahead. So we had a bunch of change orders because we missed our last meeting with you guys, so it sort of piled up. Um, a whole series of change orders. The Meyer change orders here are all general construction change orders for new chases, ceiling height um, modifications due to duct conflicts, window sills, which is an existing condition. A lot of these are discovered conditions. There's also some credits for materials that we didn't need that were in the documents for control joints in the floors, which we determined were not necessary, and edge metal trim on the roof, which we were able to keep the existing edge metal trim for our savings there. Um, the furring at Nurse 14 in Classroom 11. Um, as you recall, we've said before, this project was originally developed more as a mechanical project. It wasn't like a full renovation, and we've been trying to work together with the contractors at the direction of the district to really accomplish a lot of renovation work. So that means furring out walls that were not perfect, updating outlets and other fixtures for the, for the classroom. So that's what that change order is about, wall furring. Also, 
the classroom 11 door opening was a door between the conference room and the classroom, which was covered over, and now that's been eliminated entirely. So that door is going to be gone between that classroom and the, and the, the conference room. 30 and 31 soffit repairs. Again, discovered condition that damage on the, the soffits above the windows, cracking, which couldn't allow us to put the new finishes up. So it was a, a minor repair there, and wall patching as part of the repairs of the classrooms. Um, go ahead, next slide. Hudson Valley is our electrical contractor, and they've been working with us on a time and material basis to do a lot of these upgrades to the classroom spaces. Some of, some of these, the miscellaneous, miscellaneous electrical classroom repairs, that's, that's that, the, the, like a bucket of, of hours where they just keep going and doing little projects. That was, the pro that was the first change order for miscellaneous repairs of the first area. There's going to be another one for the current area and an upcoming work. So there's going to be another change order like that. That's around $3,400 for that, that level of work. Um, conduit at the lift opening, discovered conditions. The electric panel at the ladder, we relocated the panel because it was in conflict with existing um, materials. Um, room 21, electric relocation. Theatrical service upgrade, that's an improvement that's going to give you better functionality with a the theater. And then HVAC power and disconnects, that goes back to that coordination we were talking about between the mechanical equipment, which was bought separately, and the contracts which the mechanical contractor has. So there are items that needed to be done by the electrician to provide power that, that was in nobody's scope. So that was just dealt with there. And there's probably going to be another change order like that for this phase of work as well, um, upcoming. Go ahead. I think this is the last page. Um, more general construction finishes that are more recent, wall patching. The vestibule by the kindergarten room has been replaced. We're buying a new storefront. Um, for that area because existing wood was outdated and not functioning well and didn't, it conflicted with the flooring. The flooring raised it up about three quarters of an, or three eighths of an inch, but enough to cause us to say, well, why repair a door that we need to replace anyways? And it had wire glass in it as well. So that whole frame had to be replaced with a new, um, new framing system. And so that's the next two, a vestibule V7 removals and then the doors and frame. They also built a new soffit and repaired the ceilings. We also insulated that vestibule, which wasn't insulated before. It's all insulated now, so it's weather tight. Um, the door hardware substitution has to do with the lead time issues, and we're coming up with more of that these days. Um, we're going to come up to you soon with other, other issues like that related to doors and hardware, material and supply issues where we've, our suppliers have been not able to provide um, for what they committed to in, in, in fall, and now we're going back to them and looking for new suppliers. So that was a, a we picked actually, in this case, we got a higher level um, hard, door hardware for the, the main entry doors over here. So it actually was an improvement, but it also came faster because it wasn't going to come on time. And the basement VAT and first floor VAT, that's vinyl asbestos tile. That's what's being removed next week. Um, those removals are going to be, um, were discovered conditions um, beyond what was shown in the contract. And then the admin toilet convector, again, is the two little toilets right next to the admin area. There's a little heater in there which wasn't on the documents that had to get removed um, to finish those spaces because they're, they're getting refinished in the summertime. And the last two, um, the last one are the pads. They're actually installing right now for the mechanical equipment. The, the units themselves, the, the document showed reusing the existing concrete pads, which the equipment sits on. And the equipment is about twice as large as what they were expecting it was going to be. So it ends up um, pushing the tads around. And they had, they're doing it right. They just finished it, actually. It's all done to make new pads, expanded pads, to support the new equipment, which is in contract. So I think that's it, Dusty, for the change orders. Um, so let me stop right there. Any questions on all the details there? So I did receive some questions from Madeline that I wanted to bring forward for this. Sure. Um, Regarding the change orders, specifically to like the window ones, do we anticipate that additional ones for conditions such like the windows moving forward? And should we plan to set aside a portion of our existing um, a contingency in order to hold for those sure. change orders? So go back another one, Dusty. I, uh, another one, actually, <laughs> sorry. Um, so the window sills and the soffit repairs I think, is that, do you think that's what Madeline was talking about? She was looking for the, any conditions that we see in one area that may be replicated in another area that we haven't right. reached, but perhaps we haven't allocated the funds for. Gotcha. To make sure that we, when we're looking at our contingency, we know that some of that money has already been set aside Great. for conditions such as windows. Um, we have set aside some money for that. Um, okay. the, the work we've done is in the older portion of the building. 
the balance of the work is in the middle school area, and there's not a lot of window work. Okay. There's a little bit of work at the main office where we're taking out the air conditioners and, and doing some glazing in the main, op the main admin area. Um, but so that's a great idea, and we'll make sure we have money saved for it. But there shouldn't be a lot of money. I mean, as you see, the, the sills are unique to the classroom spaces. That's not going to happen again. And the software repairs for two classrooms was about $2,400. Mm -hmm. So it, probably three to $4,000 would be more than enough to cover any discovered conditions. Right now, with related to the windows, right now we're in the art room and collaboration room, and there may be finish-related issues there because one area was stained and one area is painted, things like that in nature. That's going to be optional um, to fix, but there will be things like that. How much would that be? I'm sorry? How much would that be, that kind of... Um, probably in the same ballpark, uh -huh. um, probably two to $3,000 to, to paint. I mean, it depends what you want to do. If we're painting stained wood, that's easy. If we're, if we're stripping and refinishing painted wood, uh -huh. that's, that might be nicer, but that's going to cost more. So we'll have to decide which, which way okay. we want to go. But all that stuff is, is going to be in the five to $10,000 range at max. And what else? All of Madeline's questions so far. Anyone else have any questions regarding this? Related, related to what Sarah's asking and what Madeline's asking is, do you have um, those projections and you're already setting the money aside so no. that we know? And is there any way, I don't know, maybe the facilities committee knows this, but like of the X thousand dollars in contingency that we have, how much are we really saving that we cannot spend? Great. That's a perfect segue to the next slide. Oh. So let's go forward awesome. to the budget slide, which shows the contingency and what we're holding back and so forth. So the original construction contracts are on the left. That's $6 million. The approved change orders to date are, are $400,000, all in, everything so far to date. Um, the pending change orders are exactly what you're talking about. The things that haven't happened yet, which we've reserved money for, which we think are coming. So we've saved, set aside $94,000 for upcoming unknown, unspecific, um, GC-related, general construction-related change orders. So that will definitely cover the things we're talking about. That's sort of what we set aside for that already. Um, and similarly, Bertusi, we have about 5,000, 2,500. Now, these are, most of these are things we know about, um, but there's also money in there for things that, some of those may not happen also. And then in addition to that, um, the, um, I'm sorry, so on, and on the right-hand side is the, the total of those two. So the approval, approved already, plus the pending, is a 375 for the GC and the 520 total. So we right now, everything we know about and everything we're planning for to make sure we have covered is about $520,000 worth of change orders for the project, which amounts to about 8.5%. So the ballpark for, for budgeting, typically we hold about 10% contingency. So right now, we we're, we're expecting to spend about 520, which is about 8.5% contingency at the end of the day. Um, and things like that we we're talking about would bump that up to maybe nine but we wouldn't go over that. Um, it's where we, what's how it looks right now. And as far as the, you know, we had this conversation last, last fall about upcoming demolition and discovering things. Now the demolition's mostly done. The level of renovation in the, art, in the admin areas is pretty minimal compared to what we've done so far. The largest area right now of exposure will probably be down in the CSE area. Where we're gonna be building a lift, and, um, but we've already opened up all those spaces. We're not gonna come in new walls. So I don't expect a lot of, of new discovered situations. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the next slide gives us a, a bigger picture. Oh, this, this one, um, so similar to what we've been seeing all the time, the changes are, are pretty evenly split between owner requested changes, field conditions, which we've been finding more and more field conditions as we've gone through the project, things that were just inherent in the building, and architect initiated changes, some of which are improvements and some of which are related to um, the documents and the scope of work. So, those three areas are pretty equally spread. So this is the overall project picture in terms of contract payments so far to date. So again, we've spent six, the original contract was $6 million. The change orders is 393 to date. The current contracts um, that we, of the sum of those two is 6.5 million and we made payments about 3.5 million. So we're about 54% done of, um, with the payment side we're about 65% to 70% done with most of the construction. And if you look on the right-hand side, um, you know, we were, um, Myers about 60%, and Hudson Valley, the electrical contractor, is about 70%. They're almost done. Pertussi's really kicking in high gear now. So this middle school is a large portion of their work. 
the demolition of this area, and they have yet to demo the boiler plant in the old building. So their work's really going to be pushing through the summer. That's why they're behind. Their renovation sort of was in front of them, and the mechanical is following, behind, following after the renovations work. Um, so remaining on the contract, we have about $3 million yet to, to pay out um, to the contractors on our original budget. And go ahead to the next slide, Dusty. So this is a spending analysis, which includes the contracts, the, um, the telephone data and security, which is a separate item from the, from the base prime contracts, and the electrical equipment, I'm sorry, the mechanical equipment, which as I mentioned is separate from the mechanical construction contract. So um, it also, this, this um, chart shows the project soft costs. So our budgeted soft costs were about 1.9 million, 1,872,000. And of that, we spent about 1.2. And our pending that we've anticipated looking, you know, going over it with Joe and what we expect on the project, about we're going to probably spend maybe $480,000 more of project soft costs. And that includes abatement expenses and things like that in that soft cost amount. So the project soft cost is actually running about $200,000 under budget. We, we look like we're going to end up winning extra money from that, from that line item. Um, the prime contracts are about 6.6 .6 all in. Um, so right now, let's go to the bottom line here. The capital project budget is 9.9 .9 million. All in with what we're spent so far and what we expect to spend in the future, the pending work and what we're anticipating is 9.4. So we, right now, we believe we have about $525,000 of contingency remaining on the project. So about half a million dollars. So let's stop there and we'll take questions on the budget. And this do I have questions on the budget there is as presented? No, thank you for coming in under. Oh, hey, it wasn't me. <laughs> it's, a, it's a combination of, of people, and, and things are going well. You know, we have these contingencies for a reason. It's really nice not to have to use them. And we've used a lot of it, but you know, we haven't used all of it, and we've, we've found more because the expenses for things like soft costs have not been what we expected. So those things are good. And, that, and as you can see, things like Edutech, there are other things that were added to Edutech's budget. You know, there's a little bit higher there than originally in the budget, but that was fine. Those things are, you know, additional services and value for the district was, a, was able to be achieved with the money. I think that's my last slide. Is there another one? Okay, what's, what's next? Okay, so as I mentioned, um, we just finished up renovation area three, which includes the nurse's office, which has some cabinetry that needs to be completed, but the area is functioning. The art room and collaboration is where we're working right now, and that should be done by the end of April. Over spring break next week, we're doing the abatement. Um, a change to this, we're actually also probably going to be doing the middle school floors over the break. That's our plan. Um, so we may come back to have the middle school floors done as well, which will put us ahead for summer in that regard also. And then May and June, we're going to continue with mechanical work in the middle school to get that finished up and ready to go. So that in the summer, what we have left, um, well, one thing what we talked about since our last meeting is we're going to be running summer school here for the month of July, as I think that was discussed at the prior board meeting, um, where location is still to be determined. We expect that if mechanical work is, is moving as we expect, we'll have air conditioning in the middle school. It might be nice to have it up there. Um, and because, as I mentioned, the, the CSE area, which is downstairs, is going to be under construction right next to the elementary wing. So it'd be nice to have them remote from that area as much as possible. Um, during the summer, we go from second shift work to daytime work, which will be the same time frame as the kids are here, which is in the mornings. Um, the renovation which is happening over the summer is the library, which you guys, I'm sure, have talked about a lot. And, but the, the construction side is, is basic shell, finishes, ceiling, you know, all the basic construction um, is happening in contract. The kindergarten room, which has a carpet now, but that's going to be replaced with, with flooring like all other spaces. And the music room adjacent to that. And the cafeteria, which has been in need of, of being finished for a while. So that's going to be nice to have that done over the summer. The main office entrance, the new vestibule, is going to be going into the main office in that, that area. And the admin area mechanical units and toilet rooms. So those multi-student toilet rooms right next to the, across from the office, those are going to be fully renovated over the summer as well. Um, and then in the middle school and actually throughout the building will be doors and hardware up upgrades and also the floors, which may be done spring break and there may be anything that's not done spring break will be done over the summertime. Um, didn't mention, it's not on the slide here, but the field work is also proceeding. Um, 
the, the, this spring break, we're hoping to have the fencing up so we can, that field can be playable when we get back. That's our hope. Um, so there's, you know, it's a little rough. If anybody's been out there, you know, the transition on the field's a little rough. So they've been doing some regrading and some new grass. So that may need to seed for a while and may need to grow, but we'll find ways to get on the field is the plan. And the fencing will be up. And um, most of the other exterior work will be accomplished. There's very small stuff to happen over the summer. But basically, all the areas that have been torn up are going to be restored over the summertime. So that's going to be happening sort of as we phase out of construction. We'll be moving trailers out and clearing those spaces off and getting the space back to, to nice new green spaces for the, for the school year in September. So that's the plan. Okay. So one question. Um, Meyer Construction, some of the other groups, they're going to be working continuously through spring. Um, I know in the past we talked about we had this sort of empty space, and it looks like in the calendar, and it looks like from this schedule that you filled all that in. Well, you so those, we're, we're going to keep working straight through. No one's going to decamp and have to come back. No, their plan is to decamp. Um, they are. The other contractors are going to keep working, but Meyer right now is planning to to demobilize. De we'll see if that's, that's possible. We have, you know, they just give us a schedule this week, which we're reviewing, which shows how they're going to complete the work. And we're, they have to convince us that they can get it done on schedule because we're not going to allow them to delay into the summer, into the, the school, the fall year. But okay. um, their plan is to wrap up the art room collaboration space and then take a break. But they also have a lot of punch list work in the other areas that has to keep happening. So there's a lot of contract work. I think they're going to find it behooves them to keep working um, because there's a lot to be done. Are there any um, additional costs associated with them demobilizing and having to remobilize on site? No, but um, it, it's all at their option. You know, the district has been very accommodating with them. We've offered them, and you know, up until recently, we expected them to keep moving into library and other spaces. And we, the district's been making those spaces available to them to use, but they decided for their own for their own business reasons that they were better off stepping back for a while and then coming in. But they may change their plans. Um, Chris Myers is scheduled to be here the rest of this week, so I'll be showing him all the conditions, and, and we'll see what he thinks by, by next week about that. Um, Do I have additional questions regarding the update? Kent? So substantial completion. Can you define that? Sure. It's as spaces that are able to be used for their, um, for their intended purpose. So a uh, space can be substantially complete, like the nurse's office. It's complete. The bathroom functions, the lights, everything works in there, but the casework is not quite right. Some parts of it have, you know, it was ordered, it was incorrectly fabricated, has to be remade, um, things like that nature. It's usable, it's not ideal, but it is substantially complete, and things like the um, mechanical systems, the heating systems, are in operation. Warranties have begun on those types of items. So, that, so when do you anticipate you guys will leave the building for good? We are on schedule to leave the building for good. Um, in terms of substantial completion, end of August. That's our substantial completion date. Um, in terms of actually being out of here, I think there'll be punch list probably going on in September, maybe in October, but we're not going to be here for Halloween. That's not my plan. <laughs> we are, you know, then, and the reason we might be here later is we've had some recent things that we've discovered about, well, the general con contractor has told us the doors are delayed, so we're working out with them to try to get a different door manufacturer to get doors that are not delayed. And even though not delayed doors are going to come in July into August. So things like that are going to probably push us out. But those things don't impact the substantial completion because they'll be giving us temporary doors until the final doors are in place. So one way or the other, they're going to get it done. It's just we're, things are not always ideal. Yep. Got it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? OK. All right. Thank you, Eric. Thank You're you welcome. for your time this night. No problem. We're going to move on to our second presentation for this evening, which is Parent Square and the District website. Mr. Samantano, invite you to the podium. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, let me just dive in here. There we go. All right, uh, thank you. I just want to come in tonight and give you a quick update on our progress on our district communications plan and some of the work that's been taking place around that. So we have two substantial announcements tonight we'd like to share with the community um, around this. 
Um, to get started, though, I just want to remind us of your Board of Education goal from last year around communication. And this was focused on really developing a strong community relationship um, by supporting a communications plan, which is underway, and then encouraging the community to contribute positively to the district through committee, task force, volunteer opportunities, and general communications. So we've been doing a lot of work this year identifying some of the challenges around district communications and some of the areas for potential growth. And so we're gonna focus on two of those this evening, one being the launch of the new district website and the second being the forthcoming launch of our new communications platform. So I just wanna run through some of uh, the things we've changed and added and improved, um, and then we go from there. So before I start, I do wanna focus on one of the underlying goals here, which was to address some of the efficiencies and cost questions associated with district communications. Um, and so to, to really zero in on what we're gonna look at tonight, which is the website and the communications platform, I just wanna give you a year over year comparison of what the district is spending. Um, for example, the website, our previous website, the one that was live up until a few days ago, was costing us between five and $6,000 a year. And that's for the platform and the content management, the templates and design and so forth. The new website which we unveiled today and which I'll show you momentarily is costing the district less than $300. So you can see it's a substantial savings and we believe it's actually a tremendous improvement in design and usability and so forth. And we'll, we'll take a look at it shortly. So there's a big savings there. Going hand in hand with the website though is our platform that we use for communication. So we're currently using uh, a tool called Blackboard, which allows us to send out mass phone calls in emergency situations, as well as email blasts and so forth. Um, and it works well, but it's very limited in scope, and it's not a terribly intuitive or useful tool, frankly. Um, the cost of it was 881 a year, so a reasonable cost. Our upgrade to Parent Square, which I'm gonna share with you shortly, is come along with a bit of a cost increase. Um, however, it offers a lot more functionality and flexibility, which we'll see. So if you look at the communications as a whole, we're looking at shaving our communications budget in more than half with tremendous improvements in design, efficiency, functionality, et cetera. Um, so that's a good thing to keep in mind as we look at some of these changes. So as I presented earlier in the year to the board, our goal with the district website was to create something that is more informational. Um, the existing website uh, was designed for very large institutions and had a lot of interactive functionality, um, but not tools we were really using or needed as our district. Um, and so we felt it made sense to shift to a more thought out, designed and intuitive website. Clean, modern, responsive, looks good on all devices. Um, accessible and uh, offers features like translation and things like that, um, intuitive and relevant to our needs. Similarly, with our communications platform, we were really looking for a tool that offered more than Blackboard was offering. So we wanted the ability to not only send out blast emails, but to have one-on-one -on -one messaging between parents and teachers or administrators to have field trip permission slips and digital signatures and payments and appointment signups and all of these different things that uh, take up a lot of time administratively, we can now do under one umbrella. So that was really our goal in the shift of platforms. So to begin, let's go back to the website for a moment. So the website did launch yesterday, it is live now. Um, and I'm just gonna pull it up here really quick so we can take a look at the live website. There we go. Um, so you can see, we, we decided to go with a very streamlined and kind of slick interface, very modern look. Let me just make it a little bigger here for you. Um, we have some wonderful new photography featured throughout the site. We have our latest news feed here, which is pulling from our new Parent Square account, um, as you can see that here. Uh, if I scroll down, we added some features that were requested, things like having a little banner that said what the schedule day is each day, um, and lots of photos throughout and information about our goals, our strategic plan as a district, and so forth. Um, down in the footer of every page, I want to point out a couple things that are particularly important. Um, first of all, we do have the ability to translate the whole site. The goal is to make this website as accessible to any user in the world as possible. So we have built-in translation. 
Um, and we've also been very careful to make the website accessible to any um, individuals with any sort of disability. Uh, so the design itself was focused on accessibility, but we've also, also built in an additional tool which can be accessed here, which you will see, um, which allows the user to do things like increase the contrast or the font size, the spacing, change the fonts, et cetera, so that any user with any unique needs can access the content without any major issues. Um, so I'm not going to go through the whole site, of course, but just to give you a sample, if you look, here's the menu. This is a modern slide over menu where you can view all of the pages at once. Um, if I jump over to, for example, the district calendar, we now have our calendar here. Um, and this is also the same calendar that's available within Parent Square, the same calendar we use as a district. They're all linked together. Um, and so you can search and sort, and you could subscribe, and you could download the overview, and, and so forth. So a lot of functionality, things that were requested throughout the process. Um, we've also built a one page location for parents to go, which has all of the resources that parents require in one spot. Um, and it's all searchable, so it's very quickly to, uh, very easy to come in and find exactly what you're looking for. Um, we're also building a frequently asked questions page for parents that will be added to as questions continue to come in. We're trying to make it as easy as possible for individuals to find the information they're looking for. Um, just to give you a sense, we're also really trying to showcase some of the learning. So we've built an environmental education page with lots of information about our stream teaching, um, as well as dedicated teaching and learning pages um, for all the different disciplines. So for example, we have a dedicated page that talks all about physical education and information about all of the, the grade level work. So lots built into this, and of course, the nice thing about how we built it is that we can very quickly and easily add content, edit content, um, and enhance the site over time. So that site is now live. Um, anyone can check it out, and of course, we welcome feedback on the website and suggestions, and if we find any typos, let us know, anything like that. All right. Second, uh, I just want to mention on the website before we go on, um, it was very important to me that when we constructed this, we had a, a, a modern functional website, so something that performs at a very high speed, looks good on all devices. So as you can see, this, this window on the top left, this is a tool from Google called Page Insights that measures the performance of a website, and you can see our interior pages get 100 rating, which means they are as fast loading as can be, um, which in the world of web design is significant. If you, you have a lot of websites, especially school websites, that take 10, 20, 30 seconds just to load a page. So that was a priority of ours. And again, I mentioned accessibility. So on the bottom, you can see one of the accessibility testers. And we scored a 90% right now. Um, there is some, a little bit of room for improvement where we can make some tweaks behind the scene to ensure we are as accessible as possible. Um, so that was really a primary focus of us uh, of ours as we built these platforms out. On to communications. So we have adopted Parent Square. This is a replacement for Blackboard. Parent Square is this, as I mentioned, one-stop shop where the community can essentially connect. It's going to replace Blackboard for our urgent communications, so snow closures, emergency phone calls, emails, texts, et cetera. But it's also going to be used for day-to-day -day communications between teachers and parents, admin and parents, et cetera. Um, and we're, we're hoping that we're able to really create a, a, a nice tight connection with the community by sharing additional content. You know, teachers are looking forward already to being able to snap photos of students during the day and share them with parents so they can kind of get a glimpse into the classroom, and we're really excited for that. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about Parent Square, um, it's, this, it's, it's marketed as a parent engagement tool, and it's all about communication and collaboration with parents. It's meant to take the messy communications workflows that exist in most schools, where you have lots of different tools and lots of different vehicles for communication, and it's meant to streamline them all through this one central platform. And so, how can it support our teaching and learning? And so, there are mountains and mountains of research 
that suggest that the more involved parents and guardians are in their children's education, the more successful the students are. This is just one of many quotes. This is from the National PTA. The most accurate predictors of student achievement in school are not family income. They're not social status, but the extent to which the family is involved in the child's education. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here through both the new website and this communications platform, is create that bridge to the community. So what can Parent Square do? I'm not gonna go through all the features, certainly. It's a, quite an extensive list, but just to give you an idea, under this umbrella, we'll be able to securely have our urgent alerts, communications, parents and students, things like polls, per permission slips, uh, sign-ups for parent-teacher meetings, conferences, photo sharing. Uh, eventually, when we have a, if we have a lunch program, we'll be able to do lunch payments through here, calendar events. Um, essentially, every communications need we should have will be covered by this. So this is a platform that we hope to grow into over time. Um, again, I'm not going to go through it all, but just so you can get a sense of what the interface looks like, this is fully functional on a computer, phone, there's a dedicated free app that can be used on all smartphones. You can get push notifications and text messages, and you can customize it. It has built-in translations, and the features are really endless. We'll be using this for updates. In fact, our first building newsletter, which comes out on Friday, will be going out through Parent Square this week, which we're excited about. Um, Teacher-parent messaging can happen. This is secure conversations that can happen right within the app. Um, there's a student communication tool, social sharing should we continue with social media, attendance features, appointment signups, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, so we're really excited about rolling this out and being able to really harness all these different features to enhance the connection with the community. I'm jump ahead because there are quite a few features as you can see. Uh, Okay, so just to sum up here, our timeline for launching this. Um, so we've been working on this for quite a while. We began configuring and syncing data with Parent Square back in early March. Um, we did an internal training with our admin team also in March. And then last week we met with our teachers and shared it with them and began some initial training with our faculty. Um, and that's gonna continue on our upcoming conference days. Um, and then today, April 6th, is our community launch. So we're formally announcing this to the community today. And the hope and the reason we're launching it now is so that we can work out any kinks and everyone get up to speed so that we can really hit the ground running with this platform come the fall. But we do hope to be using it fully later this spring. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to click the button and send invitations out to the entire um, Guff's parent community and uh, everyone will be able to register. It takes about two seconds to sign up, and then we're off and running. Um, I am gonna hold an evening the week after the break, uh, just a remote session for a half hour or so, just to give an overview to any parents who might wanna come on and ask questions or need any sort of assistance, and of course, we'll be available beyond that for any support that is needed. And so, that is all I'd like to share tonight. Are there any questions? Thank you. you have a Go ahead, Courtney. Thank you. Uh, um, you mentioned uh, discussing the website that there were certain things requested. Um, can you talk about your collaboration process, who you worked with? Sure, absolutely. So earlier in the year, we did do a formal community survey associated with our strategic coherence planning process. And we were able to gather a lot of feedback. There was a lot of really great kind of granular feedback. I, I would like to see this. I would like the calendar to be more easy to navigate. I would like um, to be able to find the document I'm looking for more quickly and feedback like that, which we took into this. Um, and then throughout the year, I've been having conversations with the uh, faculty and the admin team and trying to identify some of the, the gaps, some of the places where we need to fill in with information. Um, and so we've taken kind of all that data and put it in a pool and used that through the planning process as we built the new site. Um, it is certainly one of the benefits of using a more customized solution in-house is that if a need or a request comes up, which I fully anticipate, we can build it and we can add that feature without being kind of handcuffed by the constraints of some larger corporate platform. Um, so we're very excited. I very much see this, I think we all do, as a work in progress, and we hope to continue to kind of build it out over time. And uh, I want that to be as collaborative a process as possible. 
Um, so in, I, there is a notification on Parent Square about the launch of the new website, and I, I included email, and I'm really encouraging the community to share feedback and requests and things like that, and we'll do our best to build everything out. work. Um, I know it takes a lot in-house to do it all. And so my only question is, parents have to register to receive it. So what's the deal if someone misses their email, doesn't register? Sure. So um, one of the wonderful things about ParentSquare is the data piece of it. So it is syncing with eSchool data, which is our student information system. So all the parent contact information is already uploaded into it. We're going to send out these invitations, which everyone will receive, and like I said, just click a button and register. But for people who do not register, if they miss the email or if they forget to take care of it, A, we can still reach them um, because our notifications, particularly our urgent notifications, but all notifications will still go to that contact information. And additionally, I will know on our end who has and who has not registered, and we can send out some gentle reminders and do any sort of training and outreach that's necessary. The platform is most functional with 100% buy-in. So that's one of the reasons we want to kind of launch on the early side so that we have time to get as many people engaged with the platform and using it as possible. Um, I hope and I feel confident that we'll be able to get to 100% registered uh, users. And if we don't, we'll, we'll still be able to contact those individuals should there be an emergency, God forbid, or something like that. So. David? This looks really great. I guess what I'm curious about is there, there are so many different ways, things that this does. For the average, you, you talked about the goal of getting parents more involved in the school, and more connected to what's happening here. So what are the features that you think will be most, uh, that will facil best facilitate that kind of connection or enhance the parental Absolutely. So one of my favorite features, so there are two things that come to mind right off the bat. And one is the two-way messaging. So this platform makes it exceptionally easy for a teacher to send a quick message or a more detailed message to a parent. There's no searching for contact information. There's no emails getting lost. It's all secure through the app, very quick and easy. And so that facilitates or encourages conversation. Um, so that's one piece. The second piece are all these kind of ancillary tools built in. For example, um, there's a whole feature about volunteer signups. So we certainly are hoping that when we have events coming up, this will allow us to really connect with community members and encourage them to come in and participate in an event like our Youth Climate Summit coming up, or even a dance or a sporting event. Um, so we really hope to use this platform to make those sorts of connections and make it very easy to garner that participation. Um, but I could go on and on. I mean, there's a whole list of those sorts of features. Um, the whole rationale behind the platform is that connection, that engagement. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we went down this road rather than something like we have now, Blackboard, which is largely a one-way tool where we're just pushing information out. This en encourages a back and forth, and that's what our goal is. Sure. A question for you. How does this help us become more 2D compliant. I know that 2D compliant is sort of a you know, big term out there since 2014 when those laws went into place. Is this getting us fully there? Sure, so um, this is Ed Law 2D, which is New York State data privacy law, in which we, the goal is essentially to make sure we are protecting all student personally identifiable information. Um, and this is a big step in that direction. So ParentSquare is an EdLaw 2D compliant platform fully. Um, so all communications that go through the platform are fully secure. Um, and additionally, it has some features which I didn't mention. It has a secure document delivery feature, um, which is a real step up for us because, um, I mean, Technically, using email, a lot of the ways that districts use email is not compliant because email doesn't have the security, doesn't meet the security threshold that the, the law requires. Um, so this will help us quite a bit in moving in that direction if we can kind of have all our communications happening within this kind of, they call them a walled garden because it's essentially a locked area that is totally secure. And if all of our information flow is within that walled garden, then we are compliant, which is one of the goals here as well. Thank you. And then one other question. Um, 
For the curriculum content areas, was that all provided by the classroom teachers for those specific grades and those specific content areas? It was. So we, we were able to spend some time earlier in the spring and um, had our faculty spend some time collaborating with each other to write up um, what is at this point a kind of a starting point curriculum overview, overview for the key concepts, topics, and activities that are taught within each grade level and in the different disciplines. Um, it's a wonderful start. It's, it's a great addition to the website. It was something that we did not have in the website in the past. Um, and it is also a work in progress. We hope to continue to build that out and do things like add additional photos and artifacts of student work and so forth to begin to really communicate the wonderful teaching and learning that's happening here. But that was our starting point, yes. And it was a full collaboration with the faculty. Thank you. Sure. Do we have any other questions for Mr. Samantano before we move on? OK, thank, thank you thank for you. your time this evening. Thank you. OK, we will now move on to the 2022-2023 budget presentation. Uh, before I turn this over to Carl and Joe, I'm going to invite our chair of the Finance Committee, Kent, to speak a little bit about our process and how we are, where we are at this point. Thank you, Sarah. So thanks to the community for coming out tonight. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a different situation we've been in the past. There's been a lot of work done on this budget. We have a lot more challenges than we have in the past. Um, but this board's worked very hard to look at all the different things that we need to do, and Carl and Joe have done the same. Um, I'm really happy to have them take you through it tonight. Uh, I wanna thank them for their, the hard work they put into this, um, for answering the seemingly continual flow of questions, both from the board and the community, um, and the patience they've shown with that. I also wanna thank the board. You all have been very engaged in this process. Uh, we're, we're gonna get to a better place because of it, so that's also very much appreciated. So uh, with, that, with that further ado, uh, we'll, let's, let's go to the main show, and Joe, we'll leave it to Carl. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Kent. Um, the questions that have come in over the past month um, are truly welcomed. Uh, I'm glad to see a large audience this evening, but please know um, it is never a burden. Um, our goal is transparency and effective communication. Um, and you look, if you look at our budget uh, objectives, uh, the first one is involve the community, the key stakeholders, and hopefully uh, we are accomplishing that. Uh, moving through the presentation now this evening, some of the information has already been presented. Some of it has evolved with the budget process and after receiving feedback from the board and the community. So we're gonna move a little more quickly through things that have not changed. Um, and then we'll slow down for some new things and things that have evolved over time. Also, we welcome the board's uh, questions as, as we move through and we're happy to have a dialogue and respond to them. Um, the second budget objective um, is to analyze those portions of the budget that are increasing disproportionately as compared to the allowable tax levy, which is either 2% or the, the CPI, whichever is less. Also, maintaining budget lines that are consistent with actual spending. We've, Joe Jimmick really has spent an enormous amount of time studying past trends. Uh, we've had past budgets where there was probably too much contingency, at least in my opinion, and I think in the Finance Committee's opinion. Uh, for example, with high school, special, uh, high school tuition, we've had um, budgeted maybe three or four or even five extra students uh, moving into garrison uh, during those high school years, looking at trends that, that just wasn't happening. It's possible, but it's really not probable. So Joe did uh, an awful lot of research, and, and we, we think our contingency, and there always is some contingency, but it's much more realistic. It's based on past spending and past trends. Also, um, uh, Mike Samartano briefly mentioned the strategic plan that we engaged in. Uh, it was uh, nearly a two-year process, uh, a lot of community input. Um, and we have goals and objectives that emerged from that planning process, and, and we would like this budget to support and continue to support uh, the goals and objectives of, of the district going forward. PD, uh, PD is essential to any quality school district, 
making sure that your teaching staff, your support staff, even your admin staff uh, is all receiving the necessary PD uh, to be effective at what they do every day with, with your children. Moving into the instructional programs, again, the budget really is aligned with the strategic coherence plan, which is posted on the website. It was finalized uh, just uh, about three weeks ago, and there was a presentation on it if you care to, to go back and, and listen to it. But basically, we reached out to this community. Uh, we did a, a, a thought exchange where 125 community members participated. We had, I think, about 250 comments, and they were rated. Uh, a team of 14 community members analyzed that information and really got to the heart of what this community valued. And in front of you, you see a vision of a graduate, and, and these are three skills and three dispositions that we believe every eighth grade student should leave Garrison with. Uh, these are, break it down into strategic goals and, and the three main areas. It's a lot, the plan is a lot more detailed, of course, but just in general, we are focused on aligning everything we, we do with the vision of a graduate and always coming back to that with any decision that we're making. Professional learning, again, it is essential, and then giving feedback to our students. And that really ties into what you just heard from Mike Samartano as far as enhancing this communication between parents and, and our faculty. Moving on to the highlights, um, we have a number of exciting programs and initiatives that are happening here, all aligned with the coherence plan. Let me emphasize that uh, the bullets you're going to see uh, are not necessarily major budget drivers. Of course, the expense is, is with the personnel. Um, our, our staffing is probably at least 75% of our overall budget. So behind each one of these initiatives, of course, there's staff, which is necessary. But the programs themselves, let me start. The first one is our new K-8 math program. It's aligned with the next gen standards. Uh, it was needed uh, for our students to, to be successful in, in mathematics. We had our teachers research several different programs. A committee was formed, and uh, they decided on Envisions Math. Um, fortunately, we paid for the entire program through a grant, through the ESSER grant that we received last year. And it's a five-year um, PD plan that goes along with it. Um, as well as materials, and, and there will be some ongoing cost for math workbooks and materials and supplies, but um, this was something that uh, is, is in its first year of implementation and is going very well. Also, oh yes, Sarah. Guys, please jump in if you have questions, especially like on programs and things. But with the math program, the decision to switch to this was really based on aligning with the next gen standards. So if you could elaborate a little bit on why that's important and how that impacts the students themselves. Um, and then you know, what is in next year, what is next year's plan for this program, especially as it relates to the budget? Is it just professional development? Are there any additional costs beyond that? Sure, Sarah. So you may recall that about eight, nine years ago, uh, the state implemented common core standards. So for math and ELA, we needed to align with the common core. Uh, but more recently, the next generation learning standards were issued by state ed, uh, which means all public schools throughout the state need to align with the, these new standards and, and have curriculum that is aligned. For math and every other subject, but math in particular, it is very important that at each grade level, our students are mastering particular skills. Um, because as they move up, if they have gaps in their learning, uh, eventually it will impact them you know, as they progress in their education. Uh, here in, in Garrison, in eighth grade, we do offer an opportunity um, to, to um, compete or, or to take the, the algebra regions, which is a high school level course. And again, having rigorous and, 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 and a, a comprehensive program that's aligned will better prepare our children to take that course and then of course uh, move on to advanced math in, in high school. So that is it. The second part of your question is the cost. Again, we, we paid for this through the ESSER grant. Uh, it was a package deal where there's five years of support for PD. So there's ongoing support with this program. So there's really no additional expense there. However, um, our, our um, materials like workbooks and some basic things that the district does need to provide ongoing. But that would be the case with any program. All right, thank you. Secondly, we have an environmental education program that we um, 
implemented last year. Uh, we did hire a staff member for this program. Um, in the middle school next year, uh, when I say expand, uh, there will be actual, an actual course for every sixth, seventh, and eighth grader with our environmental education teacher. Um, also, in grades K through five, there will be co-teaching model uh, at every grade level. Uh, one of the, the motivations behind doing this was when I first arrived in Garrison, a lot of our staff uh, were reluctant to, to take a class into the forest, especially the younger children, because it, it is a, you know, remote. Uh, it, it is a little uncomfortable if you have 20 children, seven-year-old, eight-year-old children, and one teacher. Um, that's really not a safe situation. And, and I listen to our staff and, and now having a second person and, and often there's also an aide that, that accompanies them. I think three people is, is a much better student teacher ratio and a safe way to do outdoor learning and things such as that. So um, this is a program that also aligns with our strategic plan goals uh, and offers benefits in many ways. Yes. Sorry, I just, I think, I just wanting to be clear that the environmental education program is not just in the forest. It's also very largely in the school classroom itself. And it's, so it's integrated throughout the school day. It's not just field trips to the forest. Absolutely, absolutely. It goes far beyond field trips in the forest. Um, and and our, our staff is, is working on a, a more aligned curriculum, but this year there were many new programs. Um, yes, in the fall there were trips out to the forest. Um, and that will happen again this spring, but all through the win winter months, there, there was in-house learning, um, and again, collaboration between teachers, and next year it will be an actual course for each one of our middle school students. So it, it goes far beyond just, just simple field trips. Matt? Can you define what that course is? Like, what is the course? Yes, uh, it, it's, it's a STEAM course. So science, technology, uh, engineering, mathematics, all integrated, Matt. It will be a lot of project-based learning. You know, in, in the core academics, we, we, we are bound by the standards and, and, and you know, at the exams that we, we don't teach to the exams, but we do have to be aligned with them. So there's a lot more freedom when you, when you set up a course, like a STEAM course, where students can really engage in problem-based learning, project-based learning. So it will look like that. And uh, we're also, right now we're planning to have our teachers work over the summer. Uh, many are putting in requests to develop curriculum even further. Oh. oh sorry, one more question, David. Um, Carl, uh, you were, the, the environmental teacher has been here for the year. Are there things that we've been doing in terms of environmental education in the last six months that we haven't done before? Oh, I, absolutely. And, and Rachel Arbor, um, if you just look at the, the Guff's Weekly, David, uh, you see just you know uh, week after week, um, I think new and innovative instruction from Rachel Arbor. Uh, she was here early in the year. She, she only was settling in about three months, but we do plan to bring her back uh, next month to give you an update, and she could speak to that. But yes, there, there are certainly, there's new and innovative instruction going on uh, on, on a daily basis, really. And, and um, we're, we're pleased, we're very pleased with, with where we are. Okay. So the next bullet um, talks about art, debate, environmental science, which we just talked about, <clears throat> and uh, theater. And also I'll combine it with, with band and chorus. So um, these are, in my opinion, as, as your superintendent, essential, essential parts of, 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 a, of a quality school district. Um, yes, there are the academics, but, but the arts, the performing arts and music and, 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 and environmental science are really important to have a quality uh, education program. Um, I did receive some feedback. People thought we were hiring extra staff to, to accomplish or, or to implement these programs. Uh, we, we have changed and made some changes when people, we had a resignation uh, and we did restructure the model of delivering some of these courses, but grand total, it actually was a budget reduction. Uh, and in fact, we have a few of our music teachers, um, band um, and chorus and, and actually theater. Um, that are working as artists in residence. We hire them through BOCES. Um, two of the three are not full-time employees, uh, but they're, they're, they enable us to offer a variety of, of 
uh, or a greater variety, I would say, of performing arts here at Guff's. Uh, they're willing to work part-time, and uh, the people are true experts, uh, each one of them in, in their field. Uh, and so this has been, I think, an enhancement, but, but it is not a budget driver. But I thought it was important to, to list this as a highlight because I do see it as an enhancement for the district. Just for all those artists in residence programs, we do get the BOCES aid back the following year, which we can then apply to continue to fund the program. So it's a 36% return to the district, and no benefits are paid on those salaries. Um, you know, I just want to add, too, that I think all of our neighboring middle schools between Haldane, um, the Highland Falls District have all of these programs as well. So when our students are going on to high school, the kids they're going to be going to high school with have been exposed to all these programs in their schools as well. Without question. So I'll add to that, and again, to keep the focus on budget. Yes, we do get a refund back in the following school year, but something like music instruction, for example, that's a very difficult thing to start <clears throat> in ninth grade. Um, some people may question, well, gee, you know, why are you starting it so early? Because you know, if our students are going to, to be able to continue with these programs and access this learning in high school, it really needs to start in elementary school. And, <clears throat> and that is what we're doing here. This next slide just gets into our social emotional learning program. Um, we're using the Yale Ruler program. It's an evidence-based program. You are required to have an SEL program. This is a very comprehensive program supported by Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES. We're part of a, a consortium uh, which includes training and materials. Uh, Mrs. Zemig and, and our, our two counselors has, have really taken the lead, but there's also been training uh, for the entire staff. Um, DBT um, is, is another program that has been in Garrison for quite some time, very, very successful. Um, and our, our, we actually won an award last year out of 46 school districts. Uh, Garrison um, had the strongest implementation of, of this program and, and, and the greatest amount of success. So kudos to our staff. Um, DEI initiatives. Uh, can I ask a question oh, about that? of Just course. To bring it back to the budget. Um, <coughs> There's certainly been a lot of talk in the news about uh, mental health for children, especially after going through the last several years of the pandemic. Um, what are, are, are these programs expensive? Um, obviously it takes, um, our, it takes staffing. I assume we're using our in-house staff. Are there other people brought in? Uh, is there PD? Is this a big chunk of our budget? Okay, uh, good question. Again, what I said earlier, the biggest expense is the staff that implements these programs. The Yale Ruler Program, Joe could probably give me the specific number. I think it's in the $3,000 annual, annually range, and we actually get aid back on that. So again, it's a minimal expense. It really does not impact the budget. Uh, DBT is a little bit more. I want to say it's about $10,000 annually. Uh, that includes professional development and support, and this is a very prescribed program. Um, but that, that is something that we've been doing for quite some time and had a lot of success with it. And you are correct, Courtney, more than ever, um, these programs are, are essential and most schools are expanding these programs. But we, I think we're in a very good place with them. Thank you. DEI, um, we have some PD money um, for our uh, initiatives. We do have a strategic plan. Uh, in fact, we have an upcoming conference day on Monday where we will be doing a lot of staff development and training uh, in this area. Again, um, it's not a huge bu budget driver, but, but it's one of our important goals for the district. Uh, the Bridges After School program, uh, just to clarify, this, this is a, um, uh, a low cost program. Uh, it, it would cost um, probably in the vicinity of three to four thousand um, dollars. And it's, it's an after school middle school program modeled on uh, Oceanside Long Island model uh, of a Bridges program where two schools uh, that were very diverse and different demographics got together uh, to have courageous conversations and, and, and to learn about one another and talk about some challenging issues in the world. Um, we, David, you have a question about this one? Um, that's, unlike some of the other programs, that's something that is really unique. I mean, they're, they're, most school districts don't have a bridges program. Why do you think it's worth, I mean, three or $4,000, but they add up over time. 
Why do you think it's worth doing a bridges program? Garrison has diversity, David, but but not as much diversity. Um, we're small, uh, and I I think uh, you know the DEI committee. Uh, as well as the board when we did our summer workshop. I, I, I think we were looking for opportunities. This came up over and over to um, have our students exposed to students from different backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, um, different ethnic backgrounds. Um, and and that's, that's difficult to do in a small district like Garrison. So uh, we, we learned about this program. Actually, I think Jocelyn first heard the presentation um, in one of the school boards association conferences. Uh, and then we started to research it, and we, we thought this would be a perfect match for our district. Uh, they had a lot of success uh, with the program out on Long Island, and, and again, I think it's a perfect match for us. Being small, uh, we don't want our children to be insular. We want them to understand that there's a big world out there, and there's a lot of different perspectives and ideas. So um, that, that is why we're including it in the budget. Okay, and the last one is, is educational field trips. Um, Garrison has a, a rich uh, history of, of accessing wonderful resources in our community uh, and, and in the surrounding areas. Um, we wanna formalize this. Um, it is not a big budget driver. Uh, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, how much do we allocate? So we're allocating 15,000. We just wanna make sure every student in grade K through eight has the opportunity to um, go out and access um, the wonderful learning that is here uh, in our local community and in nearby communities. Uh, and that also is aligned with our strategic plan, you know, accessing some of the, the, the wonderful resources in our area. Any questions on the highlights? Okay, I'll move on to class size. This you've seen before. Um, we have, um, I think, very desirable class sizes. Um, throughout the elementary school, we're projecting kindergarten, two sections of 14. First grade, one section of 18. Second grade, we'll have 23. Third and fourth grade, um, we'll have 21. And in grade five, there, there will be two sections, 111, 112. However, those uh, children currently are in two sections, so we think uh, it, it would be beneficial to maintain that. In the middle school, sixth grade would be a class of 24, seventh grade, one class of 25. Eighth grade will be in two sections, one group 13, one group 14. Uh, we do offer uh, regents courses here, um, so we wanna make sure we're, we're really supporting our children. And, and for algebra, there, there is a math eight section as well as a, an algebra section. Uh, the bottom of the slide, you'll just see that year over year, we are reducing two sections. This next slide is new. Uh, I just wanted the community to know and, and the board to, to see uh, our proposed uh, new schedule. Um, currently, Garrison um, goes by with a nine period schedule. Uh, we have 42 minute periods. Um, for the middle school, there's also some st uh, study halls or we call them flex periods built in. Um, what we did, uh, we looked at some neighboring districts that are high performing, and what we learned is that for core academics, they were ranging from 50 to 53 minutes per period. So for the core, I'm talking about math, science, social studies, ELA. So we created this schedule. I thank uh, our guidance counselor and our principal for working on this. Uh, and what you see here is periods one, two and three and seven and eight are all 51 minute periods. That's when our middle school students will, will be in core academics. Special area classes, um, art and, and music and, and theater and things like that will occur during the shorter periods, which are 42 minutes and, and those are periods four, five and six. Um, combining some classes as well as reworking the master schedule enabled us to save two full teaching positions. We, we did have one person resign, and we only uh, hired someone temporarily for the year, and we have one retiree. Um, but it was a creative way to, um, to help the budget, okay, and, and not replace two positions, but not sacrifice 
one bit of quality. In fact, I, I would argue that this schedule actually enhances uh, the student's experience, and, and we're maximizing instructional time. There's not uh, one minute of, of downtime um, in, in this schedule. There are no study halls. So overall, the staffing changes. Um, we had Mr. Twardy, who served the district well, but decided to retire back in March. Um, we decided not to replace his position. Uh, we did reallocate a lot of his responsibilities to Mr. Jimmick and, and two other uh, gentlemen in our transportation and, and facilities department. Um, we are paying them stipends, uh, but there is a, a significant cost savings with this new model. And I must say the quality has been outstanding so far. So we are proposing that we continue and do not replace that one time, uh, that full time director of facilities position. Two teaching positions, uh, again, by attrition, we have a, a retiree and we had a temporary position that we're not replacing. Uh, and we are reducing one clerical position uh, in this budget. Pause a moment on the, um, the one reduction for the AIS instructor. Um, as we've seen in previous presentations, and just because we have more people here tonight, the, um, the AIS reduction, we were able to make that happen because our core academic teachers are going to pick up AIS for the middle school students, and our, on, we have a certified English as a new language teacher already in the middle school who's going to pick up all that work as well. Yes, so that's why when you see them, we have four sections. They are then taking another section to teach AIS and do English as a new language as well. Yes. So they're taking so, on other duties in order to make this happen. Yeah, that, that's an important point, Sarah. And, and I think there was maybe a misunderstanding because I, I was asked um, the question, you know, do, do, do all teachers have full teaching assignments? The, the answer is yes, absolutely. The change is by reducing a section uh, it freed up our, our core academic teachers in the middle school, and they are picking up things such as AIS, which is a requirement. So our English teacher, for example, will have one less section of English because of a combined grade level. However, that teacher will be teaching ELA, AIS for all three grade levels. Same thing with our Spanish teacher. We're fortunate our Spanish teacher is dual certified, so also can support our English language learners. So with her one reduced section, she will also, uh, with that extra period, be working with ELL students. Um, so that, that, again, I think is, is an overall benefit of, of the new model that we're, we're proposing for next year. Uh, another summary of staff, um, again, it's just a different way to break it down, but uh, overall you're reducing two teaching positions, one clerical position, one facilities and operation position, which is really an administrative position. Um, below I added, you know, we look back uh, over the past two years, we have a 9% reduction in staff um, because we have been asked, you know, with, with a 10% override proposal, what have you done? Have you looked for efficiencies? The answer is yes. A 9% overall reduction over a two year period is significant. But I will say at this point, we have not sacrificed one bit of quality um, with, with the reductions. I think we, we've figured out creative ways to maintain quality, but also find cost savings in K-8. Yes, Ken. So I, since we're talking about staffing, I know we're moving on next. I just had a quick question that's come up repeatedly from conversations I've had in the community, digging a little deeper into a change that was made last year with, with Mr. Zamitano, that position of technology, how it transitioned from a teaching position to administration. Can you explain to, to the community a little bit more about that the amount of money we spend for Mr. San Martano, his responsibilities, and overall, what would happen if we were to remove that position from the administration line? Sure, sure, Ken. I'll, I'll give you a bit of history. Um, you heard Mr. San Martano and just a, a, a small portion of the work he's been doing, which, which is outstanding. Um, but the position itself evolved. Um, many years ago, you may remember, um, in our library media center, that there, there was a computer lab. And, and that, that was a pretty typical model where to learn about computers, you, you left the classroom, it was a special, uh, a special period for students and there was a computer teacher. Um, that model went away many years ago um, when we implemented wireless technology and uh, Garrison did set up you know, the infrastructure for wireless. 
Um, I have to say, a couple of years back, we did not have um, wireless um, devices for all of our students. We were starting to move in that direction. The pandemic certainly accelerated that, where now we have a device for you know, every student. Um, that doesn't mean we want our students on devices all the time, especially at the younger grades. Um, however, um, school, uh, schools have changed dramatically. Um, so the person who was teaching in that computer lab, that assignment was reduced and, and, and the needs for more support uh, you heard Mike talk about being 2D compliant and, and other, you know, other laws and reporting that are required of districts. Uh, that that par part of the job increased, so the person's teaching responsibilities decreased almost to, to nothing, and uh, the responsibility of supporting technology, supporting staff, supporting students and families, that increased. Uh, so there was always a position, but it was a teacher on special assignment and it was a 10-month position. A lot of technology has to occur during the summer months. So in preparing for the school year, the rollover of data, of technology, the summer is a very, very busy time. So when the person retired, I felt very strongly that this ought to be a 12-month position. Um, the cost increase, Joe can give you the details, but I would say it's minimal especially moving into next year, the administrator 12 month salary, the base salary is slightly higher, but when you factor in that the teacher on special assignment needed to get paid to work in the summer, received a stipend. Uh, also, we were using a company called Edutech. We had an on-site technician here two days a week. We are reducing that technician to one day a week. Again, Mike has done a great job of finding efficiencies. So there is a $30,000 savings there. So. Um, year over year, just from a budget perspective, we may be saving, um, but we certainly are not spending more. Um, but we did move from a teacher on special assignment to a 12-month admin. If you were to contract out the duties of him, you have a ballpark on what that would cost. Would that save us money? Yeah, you know, you we we've looked at some of this. You could not contract everything that Mike does. Um, but there are pieces you could. So, so you could, if, if you didn't have that position here um, as a permanent a GUF staff member, you probably would need three days of a technician. Um, that would be 30, roughly 30,000 per day. So there, there's 90,000 right there. There's a lot of other reporting requirements and things that, that you could contract out with BOCES, maybe another 10 or 20,000. Um, but you're really not, you're losing out on all of those improvement activities um, by how you know by farming it out and not having a full-time person in-house. That that is why I I would not recommend that. Could you survive that way? Yes, but it still would cost 110 or 120 thousand, and you're losing all the benefit of the professional development and the strategic planning and things like you saw this evening with the website and communication systems. You know all those improvement activities. Um, I think it would be very hard to contract out for those. Thank you, Carl. Appreciate it. You are welcome. So moving on just to high school enrollment. Thanks, Dusty. Um, this is just a quick projection. Um, we do have large grade levels in the middle school that are making their way into high school. We have smaller classes graduating each year. So you can see a steady uh, increase in high school enrollment, which, which is a budget driver. The next one, Dusty. This is just uh, broken out a different way. Um, Haldane, I was asked, you know, how many students per grade level? Um, you can see that here. And then the well, next can slide. I just interrupt with a yes. Quick question. When you're looking at those overall high school enrollment projections, uh, specifically for the years that we are, you know, 2020, 20, 21, 21, 22. Those numbers do not include students we know are attending private school or we anticipate will attend private school next year, correct? That is, yeah, that is correct. We, we, we factored in that at least two students each year would, would choose to attend independent private schools. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, current enrollment at Haldane by grade level. Current enrollment at James O'Neill High School by grade level, and you see, you know, some years uh, there's more students go to to O'Neill, 
other years, more students go to Haldane. Uh, it, it does seem to balance out, um, but we are slightly higher overall at, at Haldane currently. Now, uh, expense challenges. So I'm going to invite my colleague, Joe Jimmick, up, and he'll get into the financial part of the presentation. Thank you, Carl. And I want to thank everyone from the public uh, coming out tonight. It's important to um, be educated on what the budget challenges that we have and, and why we're asking um, the board to support this budget. So one of the main drivers that we have in the year-over-year -year increase is an increase in tuition rates. Haldane, um, several years ago, made a decision to move from a formula that was um, based, on, based on the growth in their, their budget year over year, and it was indexed based on that, and they're moving towards a non-resident tuition rate formula. As we discussed in previous meetings, um, the year over year increase for the current year was 20%. The year-over-year -year increase for next year is 32%. Um, so that's a, that's a big driver, um, and you'll see as we get into the numbers what that represents. In addition to that, we have uh, increases expected for transportation costs, 12%. And employee um, health insurance, we have an 8% rate increase, as well as an increase uh, participation in the, in the plan that represents a 14% increase in uh, the health insurance payments that we have to make. And on the revenue side, what we have is the tax cap. So the tax cap basically determines what the district can, can propose as a tax levy without an override. Um, the main part of the formula in, in here that drives the number is the allowable growth factor and that is 2% or the rate of inflation, whichever is less. So you can see year over year, um, the, the change that you see there is primarily that 2% and then some slight changes in the amount of capital exclusion. So year over year, under the tax cap, the levy can increase by 209,000 or 2.1%. Um, one of the things that also affects us this year, and we talked about in previous meetings, is um, there is a state aid decrease for Garrison. Um, there's a reduction year over year of 97,000. Um, that's a different story than most of the, the school districts in New York State and, and uh, also most of the districts in the area. The median increase for state aid in the area was 17%. If you take a look at our, our neighbors in Putnam County, um, you have uh, most of the districts have double digit increases in aid, and Garrison has a nearly 10% reduction in aid. So um, even though the, the budget isn't complete yet, we basically anticipate that there isn't going to be any significant changes between the uh, adopted budget and what the proposed budget is um, because the, the, um, the governor's proposal was very close to um, what the Board of Regents asked for. Um, but understanding the conditions that, that where we are, we um, basically have um, addressed all of our representatives formally to ask them for, for assistance. Um, we had several um, conversations with Senator James Scoofus, who is um, most likely, um, if the redistricting maps hold, he would probably represent um, Garrison starting in January. And we had a number of conversations with him, and, and he is, uh, is, understands our, our condition and, and what kind of a uh, fiscal challenge that we have, and he's going to do everything that he can to help us. Um, but he said at, at the outset that it wouldn't necessarily be able to um, to fill in the, the gaps that we have between um, expenses and revenue. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? I know we've, um, you've gone over it multiple times before, but um, since we have so many people in attendance, can you go over why we didn't get any state aid, why our state aid decreased? 
Yes, so um, if you take a look at the, the draft revenue, this actually is the, that slide that you had on before the draft, that was a good one. So the big um, change that you see year over year is the change in um, about two, three quarters of the way down BOCES aid. So BOCES aid is uh, something that's called an, an expense-based aid, which means that you get aid um, in the following year based upon the expenses that you had in the prior year. So um, the big um, amount of BOCES aid that we got this year is due to the uh, participation in a program that we had last year to maintain the online um, or the virtual um, option for remote learning. Uh, last year we purchased a, a program through um, BOCES called iTutor and it costs uh, 450,000 or th thereabouts um, to do that program and we get aid based upon a ratio of 36% back in the current year, which is 21-22, we get aid back for that. Um, we won't get BOCES aid back for that next year because we're not uh, participating in that program. So the biggest change that we have year over year is, is the change in that BOCES aid. Um, and while we did expect that that, was, that that was going to occur, that there would be a reduction, we, w we were hopeful that there would be other um, increases in the, um, uh, the formula-based aids, um, like the foundation aid, um, but Garrison is at the top of the foundation aid formula, so the change year over year there was, was not significant. It sounds like... I mean, has this been expressed in the lobbying of the representatives? It sounds like we're being retroactively penalized for doing everything we could to keep our district open in the darkest days of the pandemic. I don't know that that's actually the stated objective, but it feels like that. Well, I think one of the, one of the challenges is it was basically a, a mandated um, requirement that you needed to have a remote learning option and um, there, there were a number of ways that, that you, could, you could do that, but the way that the district, the district chose, chose to do it had the least impact on both the, the remote um, learning students as well as the in-person students. Um, one of the things that Garrison was able to do is um, during, obviously after the first three months of the pandemic when everyone was closed, you know, there, was, there wasn't, uh, wasn't much going on, but in, in September, you know, it, it, uh, the, the return to normal happened the best that it could because they, they, we had this remote learning option that didn't require the teachers that were in, in the classroom to, to deal with remote children as well as in-person children. And I think the educational uh, program benefited from that. Um, as far as um, are, are we being, being penalized um, because, of, because of, of what we did, I would say, I would say no, but we, um, um, we were hopeful that there would be more state aid for, for Garrison than, than there was, um, but we were held at the 3% increase for the foundation aid. Joe, one other question. We still do have our requests out a request out to FEMA for possible funding due to, because while we were technically closed as a district during those initial three months, we were open as a mandatory center because we had students of mandatory workers who had to come somewhere. So there was FEMA money that was talked about being given to us for the workers who came in during that time and then also potentially for the iTutor as well. Yeah, so we're, we're exploring um, FEMA grants and applying for FEMA grants to um, deal with the, the expenses for um, maintaining the operation and, and staying open. There's a number of, of things that we believe may be eligible for, for those grants, and we're actively pursuing those. Thank you. Okay, and if you want to take a look at the proposed budget, we could break it down into five main categories. So you have general support, which is, um, is the operation of the, the school district. It includes the business office, it includes the, um, 
the, the board, it includes the superintendent's office, it includes operations and, and maintenance, it includes um, public infor information and services, and all of, all of those items um, together, uh, year over year, has a change of 29,000 or 2%. And then you have the instructional component, um, which has a year over year change of 262,000 or 4%. Transportation, um, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail, but as a year-over-year -year change of 12%, 94,000. Employee benefits, uh, which is primarily driven from the health insurance, year-over-year -year increase of 279,000. And then debt service, which is the cost of the financing of the capital debt, uh, is, a, is basically flat year-over-year. Um, to budget, and then interfund transfers are things like um, transfers between the special aid fund and the general fund, as well as the capital fund to, from general to capital. And then the change year over year that we see there is um, we are planning to, uh, if we are able to start a uh, school school lunch program next year, that we may require a transfer to from the general fund to the school school nutrition fund. That's a year-over-year -year budget change of 671,000 or 6%. So we wanted to take a look and break this down into two basic pieces. So we have expenditures that are somewhat within our control, meaning they're expenditures that are, that are directly in this building and directly due to the work that we do here, and separate that out from uh, expenditures that happen outside of this building. So, transportation, um, the health insurance cost, and the tuition that we play, pay for um, students that are, that are educated outside of the district, both um, uh, special education and regular education students. And if we take those items out of the overall budget, we're left with $7 million of the budget. And in that seven million, um, year over year, we're uh, decreasing by ninety thousand in total. So we're uh, what what I, I think Carl pointed out with the staffing. Um, you know, we are doing what we can to reduce um, and and maximize our our ability to to um, do fiscal restraint while maintaining the educational program. So. You see um, the reductions in instruction, which is uh, the staffing that doesn't need to be, that is not being replaced, and um, you know the year-over-year -year change of minus 90,000. And then the rest of the budget are things that we can't control as easily. So we have tuition, year-over-year -year increase of 488,000, or 21 uh, percent. Transportation increase of 94,000 and a health insurance increase of 180,000 year over year. So those three items together are 762,000 or a 17% increase in those items year over year from 4.4 million to 5.2 million. So what are those cost drivers? So one of them is um, Haldane's rate per, per pupil. Um, that base rate is going to increase from the 16,000 um, estimated rate that it is currently to 21,000 next year. And that's a 32% uh, increase year over year. We don't necessarily know that that's the rate um, because this non-resident tuition rate is actually established after the year is completed. Um, so it's based on the actual expenses that a school district has and then um, those rates are actually published in December following the year, the completion of the year. And if there's any change from the estimated, um, you either get a supplemental bill or you get a, a, a refund if there's a, if there's a change in the rate. So we have to, um, we have to estimate that since the, um, the non-resident tuition rate uh, was estimated to be 18,000 last year, and it's estimated at 20,450 this year, that it will still in, increase um, for next year. So we're, uh, we're um, adding 5% on top of the estimated rate for the current year to get 
And you can see um, the, the big change there from the 2021 school year where it's 13,980 per student to our next year projected of $21,473 per student. And that's a uh, more than 50% um, increase over two years. We also do have um, increases projected for our, our, the costs that we pay for O'Neill, and we're estimating that that's going to increase 5% year over year. And there's a, take a, a look at O'Neill's uh, tuition rates. Um, you can see that they've been uh, relatively constant for the last couple of years. So we do have an increase in enrollment from 72 to 84 students. Um, and the majority of the, our large percentage of the students um, selected Haldane and seven students selected O'Neill. And three of the students selected private schools. So if we take a look at the total tuition increase of 488,000, what does that represent? 309,000 of the 488 is just due to Haldane's rate. So if you look on a student per student basis and you had the, the same rate this year um, as if they were able to hold this current year's rate next year, um, that would save 309,000. Um, so that's a significant portion of the total. 25,000 is due to Highland Falls rate and then the balance of it is due to the enrollment in regular and special education. And then we just have that on, on a pie chart there to show you um, the components of the increase. So the largest component is, is due to the Haldane's rate increase. Can you, for the benefit of everyone, explain a little bit more how we went from 13 to 21 and in, in the process by which that happened and how we weren't really able to adjust for that in a long-term fashion? Yes. So um, in January of 2021, um, we, were, we were informed of what the, the um, tuition rate that we would expect for the 21-22 school year would follow the formula that you, was used to generate. Uh, if you go back to the slide of the tuition rates, the ones with the bar graphs on it. One more. One, yeah, there we go. Okay. So, uh, from the data that you see here on this chart from 2017-18 all the way through 2021, there was a formula that essentially had a base rate and then the rate was adjusted by the, um, the rate of the tax levy increase at Haldane or the rate of the tax levy increase for the town of, of Phillipstown, whichever one was less, and that, you know, that w is what the, the rate would be. Um, was that just an informal agreement? Or no, it was, it was a contract that the, that the district had every year, uh, which was renewed based upon the same kind of terms. And in January, we anticipated that the rate was going to be uh, around $14,000 based upon the formula. That from that, so January of 2021, they had told us that the, that the rate was going to be around 14100 or something like that. Um, and then what happened is in March of, of last year, we got a call um, from, from Haldane saying that they needed to move to the non-resident tuition rate, and they needed to move to it for the 21-22 school year. And after discussions um, uh, with, with Carl and, and uh, with, a, with, a, with a superintendent at Haldane, we were able to um, get it to a point where they would split the difference and go halfway between their current rate and um, the non-resident tuition rate for the 21-22 school year, and then fully implement the, um, the NRT rate for 22-23. Um, so we, we, while what we did to balance the budget for the current year is we uh, allocated additional fund balance in order to cover the cost of the increased tuition. 
And we uh, started, started building a budget for, for this year, and what we saw when we, the non-resident tuition rate was published in December of 20450 that we needed to build um, a higher rate for, for next year, and that's where the 21000 came from. So um, we are um, actively um, trying to um, get some relief uh, for, for that rate, and there are, are um, negotiations that are, that are underway, but that currently we have to budget based upon what, what, we, um, what we believe that we need to agree to, and it's currently it's going to be 21000 based upon what we know. Thank you, Jim. Sorry. Uh, with the NRT formula, given the amount of state aid that other schools got, that these costs are only going to increase? Yes, so forward? the way the non-resident tuition formula is, is calculated, um, it, it is calculated based upon the state aid claims that are submitted by the school districts when they finish their financials in the summer. So when the, when the school year is over in, in June, um, all the school districts um, close their books and they get their, get their audits done and then they file our, their state aid claim in September. The state aid claim in September establishes what you spent per student and it also establishes um, you know, your, your enrollment so it has your beds information and all that in it and then that, that information is used by New York State to determine what your actual costs were per student and that becomes the published non-resident tuition rate in, in December. So the, 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 uh, the estimated rate for, uh, for last year was estimated to be um, 18,000, but it's, it's currently estimated to be 20,000 for the, the year we're in now. And so um, if we don't see anything that's, that's showing that the expending is gonna go down, we have to anticipate that the rate will continue to climb. David, you had a question? Really a two-part question. One is I assume that if we're uh, obligated to pay the non-resident tuition, that can increase over the years and unpredictably, right? So I guess my question is this. Um, let's assume the worst on the, on the budget vote. Let's assume that we are unable to get a, an override on the budget. Is there any realistic way that we can move the budget around to afford to send uh, our students to Haldane? If the, Assuming that, that the non-resident tuition remains as it is. If, if we uh, aren't able to, to pass, pass the override, it would be very difficult to, um, to move things around to be able to, to um, achieve that, that, that cost. So we couldn't do it, is that what you're saying? Not, not without the use of, of fund balance or, or additional, additional cuts. We would need to, to find to the money somewhere. What? We would need to find the money somewhere, whether it's in additional staffing cuts in the K-8. to It needs to come from somewhere. Carl, can you see any way to, to fill that gap? No, David. I mean, you, you just don't have the revenue to support it. Um, so as Joe is, is saying, you either need to deplete your fund balance, <clears throat> which, is, which is not a responsible thing to do, um, or find additional cuts in your K-8 program um, which we think would really negatively uh, impact uh, our program here. So uh, it, it's a real dilemma, um, but you know, that is why we, we've arrived at this place where, where we're making this recommendation of a 10% override because there, there simply is no other choice. So what you're anticipating <clears throat> is the possibility that we will no longer be able to send our, our students to Haldane. Um, that, that would have to be considered um, if, if the override proposal um, was rejected by the voters. Um, and, and that is something that you know, we, we would have to, um, you know, on, on May 18th, we would have to consider all options. Um, but we are hopeful and, and you know, we're doing, this is our sixth budget presentation because we are really, um, we need to communicate this clearly to the community because uh, the stakes are high. Uh, and, and that's why we're doing our best and we will continue to make presentations right up till the uh, May 17th vote. Jocelyn? Um, on the pie chart, maybe, will be easiest. 
So as I've been trying to consider, you know, what the override and percentages mean in my own mind, I'm thinking like each percent is kind of like hundred thousand dollars, right? It's ninety-seven thousand. Yes. So, so three percent of that override is allowing us to continue school choice to Haldane, and Correct. then one and a half percent is is allowing us to send the students that were obligated to send to high school to high school. And then as we keep going through the rest of the budget, it kind of adds up to the 10. Yeah, so um, you're, you're correct. So if you take a look at um, our, our tax levy is, is 9.7 million, the, the current, current tax levy. So 1% is basically 100,000. So 3% of the 10 uh, of the override is, is due to Haldane's tuition rate. So it's, it, I, th I don't think we can make it any clearer than that. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, we also have some increases in uh, special education. We have a, a number of, uh, of placements increasing, and we also have the number of services for um, out of district place students also increasing and this, this is uh, these, these are mandated costs that, that we have to have to deal with we don't um, currently have any uh, 12th graders who are graduating that uh, that need special education services so um, you know we, we pick up a, a net um, a net increase and then if we take a look at transportation um, they're increasing 12% year over year, and it's uh, significantly higher than it was in 1718. And that has far outpaced what we can raise under the cap. And if you look at the um, expenses year over year, you see um, basically um, a step change in between 2019 and 20, um, 1920 and 2021. And um, at the tail end of the pandemic, um, there, there was no transportation that was provided. So from from March until the um, till the end of the end of the school year in 1920, there wasn't any transportation provided. Um, there was uh, a, a decision at the time um, not to uh, pay the contractor for um, the transportation. No, the transportation that wasn't provided at the end of the year. And that, um, that, uh, that decision basically decreased the amount um, for the 1920 school year. It would have been a higher number than that. Um, over that same summer, the, um, the transportation contract was put out to bid. And uh, this was put out to bid in the middle of the pandemic. And it already was a difficult time for um, transportation contractors to get drivers even at that that time, so um, the the new contract reflected that difficulty, and we currently don't see um, any um, any relief as far as um, you know. If we put the the contract out to bid out bid now, uh, we think we would still have um, the same kind of situation um, or or a more difficult situation uh, as a result. Because if um, all of the contractors are competing for the same same drivers, they would build a, a, a bid based upon the, the condition that they know. Go ahead. Go. Um, are there any bus routes that we can, how much would it save to eliminate any bus routes that we are legally allowed, not that we want to eliminate bus routes, but if we could, which ones would we remove and how much would we save out of this column? Okay, so um, we do consolidate things where, where we can. Uh, we did consolidate some special education runs in the current year. But as far as um, the way to, um, the, to, to reduce a significant amount of, of the transportation budget, we talk about it a little bit when it comes to contingency. Um, you know, if we went to the contingent budget, one of the items on there is the elimination of, the, of a bus run by um, eliminating the transportation of students within two miles of the district. That would save around $90,000, $97,000. Um, so that um, could, could reduce the, the, the budget, but that has an effect on 
70 or so students um, that wouldn't be provided transportation and that would be a very difficult thing. Um, but that is one way that we could reduce the, the cost. Joe, I have two questions. One, um, just, or clarifying points, I guess. Um, uh, one is that this, these costs include um, all of our special education students and out of district students that we provide transportation for, is that correct? Yes, it includes um, transportation that's, that's provided for all the, all the students, K, K through 12, special and regular education students. It includes all of the, the cost of the fuel and everything, which I, we actually pay for. So part of the, the increase year over year is, um, is we're, we're um, planning for the fuel price to be elevated. Um, so all of that is, is taken into account into those numbers. Thank you. Um, also, it, for 2019-2020 school year, um, while this is showing what we actually paid or are expecting to pay, the if I'm correct, the original contract was that 485, uh, 680 number, that was originally about $200,000 higher if the year had been completed. So that puts us actually, that, that year would have closed at 685 approximately. So just clarifying that it, because it looks like the next year our transportation costs doubled. And while it did go up going out to bid, it was, it wasn't, it was a significant jump but not a, not doubled. Well, I, I would that say that. Is that right to look yeah, at it that way? I would say that there was uh, a number of, of months that were not paid for. So basically, you have uh, April, May, and June. So three months out of the 10 were not paid. So that decreased it, um, right. the, the, the payment significantly. So um, if we want to go on to the health insurance. So we have health insurance. The premium is increasing by 8%. Um, but in addition to that, we also have a higher number of uh, employees participating in the plan. And, and those that are, a lot of them are selecting family coverage. And the difference between family coverage and individual coverage is uh, from 11,000 to 27,000 is family coverage. So there's a, uh, obviously a significant uh, cost for that. And it yields a budget-to-budget -budget increase of 180,000 in total, or 14 percent. And there's a look at the expenditures that we have um, year over year. And what I can say is um, um, the the expenses that we have through the consortium. This is a, a self-funded plan, which means that um, all of the districts that participate uh, fund fund the plan and they look at the, the fund balance year over year and that's what they determine to set the rates for the, for the subsequent year. And obviously because we um, had, we were, we had a, a pandemic and we had a lot of, lot of claims, that um, basically has put enough pressure on the finances for the consortium that they feel that they need to, um, needed to raise the rate by 8%. And initially, the rate increase was going to be 6%, but then several months later, they came back to the, uh, to the districts and asked for them to approve an increase to 8%. We were um, one of five districts that voted no. There were nine districts that voted, voted yes on the rate increase. Um, so we, we wanted to have a 6% increase, but um, we were outvoted. Um, but the, there you can take a look at the, the year over year increase, um, and it's 1.4 million for 22-23. Joe, on that, just quickly with the benefits, this is with a reduction in headcount in the building as well. So we've reduced staff and our health increases are still going up at the same time, right? Yes, yeah, so, well, we have a, a number of, of things that work here. Um, we actually pay, there is actually more um, retirees in the plan than there are active employees. And you know you continue to pay um, for retiree health um, for, for life. So um, as, as people live longer, there's, there's more people on the plan. So um, there's just the cost of, of, of what it represents. Thank you. So we want to take a look at um, some 
cost considerations that we have, and the first one is inflation. So um, the tax cap was put in place in 2012, and the formula in the tax cap is 2% or the rate of inflation, whichever is less. That's the allowable growth factor. And for a number of years, that has worked um, because the, the rate um, has been at 2% or less up until 2021 and 2022. And we don't anticipate that that rate is going to decrease um, in 2023. We, we think we're in an inflationary environment and there will be challenges. So um, there is some difficulty with the tax cap formula. I would say it's likely that in, in a couple years that, that they may consider changing the formula, but because most districts got a lot of aid, I don't think it's gonna be changed um, soon. So we have some budget decisions to make. So some of the things that we have that, that are included that we talked about already, um, so we have a retirement that's um, not being replaced, and then we have, due to a reworking of the master schedule, uh, as Carl pointed out, we have had an AIS um, teacher that was on contract for just this year, and uh, that will not be renewed because the, the, um, the staff are able to pick up AIS with the way the schedule was redone. And then we have one uh, reduction of a clerical position, which are saving of 57,000. So what, how could we basically balance the budget? If we used 893,000 of fund balance to support the budget, we would still need close to 400 more. Uh, to close the gap completely, we would need uh, an allocation of fund balance and reserves of 1 million three, roughly. So to close the gap, we could al allocate fund balance, we could make additional staffing cuts, we could override the cap, or any combination of the above. So if we take a look at um, the items that are driving the cost, we have increase in general education tuition, 272,000, special education tuition, 215, transportation, 94, and health insurance, 180, 762,000. Those, um, those items exceed the gap that we have. And if we close it with fund balance, um, you could. You could build um, 1.3 million, basically, of fund balance to support next year. You would have 1.2 million of fund balance and reserves after the end of that. But what that does is that puts you into a position that um, you're not really able to build a budget for 23-24. Um, and then if you look at the, the budget and fund balance without the override, um, in 23-24, you would basically have a negative fund balance. And then if we take a look at the reserves, we have some items here that are highlighted in green, which means that they could be used to support next year's budget. And so an item there uh, that it's highlighted in yellow, we could build some justification to use some of that. Um, to support next year's budget, but we basically have 1.3 million of uh, undesignated fund balance, which is the last item, the 668, and the combination of, of the green that's above that could be used to support next year's budget. But what would happen if we did that? Um, if we use these reserves, unemployment and retirement contribution reserve and the teacher's re reserve and the reserve for tax certs, um, we would have 1.2 million left of, um, of a combination of restrict restricted reserves and, um, and um, you know, reserves for a special purpose. Joe, can you clarify when you say restricted, what that means to the district? So what that means is they can only be used for um, the purpose that it is that they're intended. So, uh, for example, the capital reserve can only be used to fund capital expenses. 
And that actually requires um, a uh, public vote in order to use it. So it, it requires a, a vote to establish the reserve, and also there's a vote to use it out of the reserve. The last, the largest item there, the reserve for debt service, can only be used for debt service payments. However, the way that the tax cap formula works is if you use any of the reserve for debt service to pay for debt service, it actually reduces the tax levy by, the, by that amount. So you can't use it to close the budget gap. You could use it to reduce the tax levy, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't close the, the, the gap between expenses and revenues. Yep. So if we go to the amount that's, that's left, if we use the fund balance and, and undesignated, uh, uh, undesignated fund balance to support next year, we only have $170,000 left of available reserve to s support a 23-24 budget. And basically the, that makes um, the undesignated fund balance go near zero. Reserves that are restricted um, can't be used to form a 23-24 budget without an override, budget cuts, or both. So what are we proposing? So we're proposing a 10% um, a um, tax levy increase or a override in order to um, preserve the, um, the designated um, reserves and not use all of the, the fund balance. And if you, if you do that, um, you can form a budget in 22-23 and 23-24 um, with, the, with the available funds. What does that mean as far as the taxpayer? So if we take a look at the, the tax, um, tax levy, the current tax levy is $9.75 per um, um, full value. Um, so it, it basically is net of the equalization rate. That's why the, the rates here show the same for Phillipstown and, and Putnam Valley. If you look at your, your bills, you will, you will see that for Phillipstown there is normally an equalization rate, but um, just for the, the simplicity, we show it here without that. So um, the current rate is $9.75 per thousand. Under the cap, we can only raise it uh, to $9.96 per thousand or 21 cents um, increase per, per thousand of, of um, full value. And, but we're proposing a 10% increase in the tax levy, um, which would be a 97 uh, cent increase um, year over year. And then um, if you had a $500,000 house, it would be an um, increase of $485 or um, $291 if you had a, a, a full value of $300,000 for the house. Um, but what, that, what does that mean? Um, Garrison has the uh, lowest um, tax rate in Putnam County. And if you look at the counties of um, Dutchess, Putnam, Westchester, Orange, and Rockland, and you look at all those school districts in those, in those counties, there's 84 school districts in those counties. Um, Garrison is, um, in terms of, if you rank them in order of from the highest amount of tax to the lowest, Garrison is number 83 on the list. Uh, so there's only one district in, um, in the 84 that has a lower tax rate than Garrison. Yep. I don't know if you've done this math, but if, if we raise our tax rate to the proposed, whatever it would be, 1072, yep. where, do, where are we in that ranking? Then we would be at 82 out of 83, 84. We would only move up one? Yes. Oh. So if we take a look at the budget summary, um, the total budget is 12.3 million. The uh, expenditures that are within the district's control is 7.1 million. It's 58% of the budget. 
These expenditures, we've been able to decrease them year over year by 90,000. And that's due to the, the staffing changes and the things that, that, that we're doing to, to, to lower the costs. And then if we take a look at the expenditures that are not within the district's control, that's 5.2 million of the budget. It's 42% of the overall budget. And those items increase by 762,000 or 17%. So these are the increases that are not within the district's control. Haldane's tuition rate, that item on its own is 309,000. Health insurance increase is 180,000. High school and special education uh, tuition increase due to enrollment is 152,000. Uh, transportation, 94,000. And Highland Falls tuition rate, 25,000. So in summary, the um, increase in the expenditures aren't um, within what we can raise under the tax cap. The district would have to allocate 1.3 million of fund balance and reserves in order to stay within the tax cap to avoid cuts to program. That amount of use of reserves and fund balance um, would only leave 1.2 in restricted reserves as of June 2023, the depletion of fund balance and reserves uh, increases fiscal stress. The use of 1.3 million in fund balance to support next year's budget would increase the interest expense for the 15-year bond that needs to be issued for the permanent financing for the capital project. So when you do um, capital projects like the one that uh, that the public authorized that we're in the process of completing. It's gonna be complete by this September. Um, while the, process, the, um, the project is underway, you do short-term financing. That's a bond anticipation notes. But once the project finishes, we need to, tra to transition to, to long-term financing. And for renovations of school district, school buildings, that's a 15-year bond. Um, so we, consulted with our fiscal advisors to find out if we used 1.3 million of fund balance and then the, the district was rated based upon that difference in fund balance, what would that mean in terms of cost um, to the public? So that would basically cost an additional $100,000 over the life of the bond due to the higher rate of, of, um, of interest that would be charged for that bond. So 1.3 million uh, or 1.25 million of restricted reserves won't support a 23-24 budget without cuts to academic program, an override or a combination. So we're recommending that the district seek a 10% override to avoid the ex excess depletion of fund balance and preserve program. The voters can override the cap with a 60% plus one majority vote. This would protect the district against unanticipated fiscal stress and the costs associated with inflationary pressures. So what happens if the override is defe defeated on May 17th? The board can hold a re-vote for the budget on June 21st, or they may propose a, um, the same or a revised budget in June or the board can prepare and adopt a contingent budget without going back to the voters. What does a contingent budget mean? A contingent budget means a 0% tax increase. So that increases the, the budget gap by 209,000, which is the amount of the cap. So the gap would be 1.5 million, and we would need to uh, reduce um, $1 million worth of cuts to avoid depleting fund balance and reserves. In order to get that level of cuts, you would need at least four certified staff. High school choice, would we would have to go to one high school. Um, we would eliminate transportation for students for, that um, reside within a two-mile radius of school, 
and modified sports. All those four things together get you 980,000. So that's the level of cuts that would be required in order to get to a, a, a contingent budget and preserve um, the, the fiscal stability of the district for the next year. But that's a very different, different educational program. And just to clarify, Joe, we could do any mixture of those should we reach that stage. We could add more, we could make additional cuts to staff as we already discussed in order to preserve choice for say the students who are already committed to going and look at it for the next year. We, we could make a lot of different decisions there as well. You, you could make a lot of different uh, decisions. None of them are good. None of them are good. Um, but if you take high school choice off the table, you'd probably have to do two more additional certified staff. All right, thank you. So then we want to talk about uh, the uh, next dates to remember. On uh, April 25th, there is a community budget forum that's going to be done virtually through the Desmond Fish Library um, through their Crowdcast. Um, they put on um, programs through, through Crowdcast, and they've uh, agreed to work with us, and we're, we're going to present some, the, the budget in a more informal way on um, Monday, April 25th. We, this is our, our sixth meeting. Um, we had a combination of regular um, board meetings as well as some informal uh, budget presentations. And um, we really value um, the, the uh, district's feedback. Um, but it's important to, to note that um, once the, the board adopts the budget, which we, we hope that they, they adopt the budget today, that Sets the, sets the budget and prepares for the vote. The other deadline that's important there is uh, on May 3rd is the deadline for voter registration. If you're not registered to, to vote, um, you need to contact the district office and speak with, with Dusty and, and get registered. On May 4th, we have a public hearing on the adopted budget. Now, it's a, a public hearing is, is basically a presentation of the budget. It's not an opportunity that the board can make any changes. Um, you know, once they adopt the budget, that is, that is the budget that's going to go to the voters. But um, there is a requirement that we have to have a public hearing to, to discuss uh, the budget and the components of the budget. And, um, and that's on May 4th. And then on Friday, May 6th, uh, we will be mailing out the, uh, the budget newsletter to all garrison taxpayers. And on Tuesday, May 17th, is the vote and board election. Thank you, Joe. Um, just to go back to that May 4th date, there's been, I believe, some confusion about when we're releasing a line by line. As soon as the board adopts a budget, we can release a formal line by line for public consumption. Is that correct? What, what, we, what we typically would do is there's a number of items that go that have to be released with the, with the budget. And not all of them are, are prepared, prepared yet. There's, there are additional disclosures. There's information that we need from the county. And within 14 days of the budget vote is when all that will be available. When, when that occurs, we will have um, the, the budget, uh, budget and all the attachments will be online. It will be available in the district office as well as a copy that we, we put at the library. But for today, you've put together the proposed summary. Yeah, the, so the, the summary, uh, which is basically a summary of the, of the cost centers, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have that avail available, and it's included in, in the information that's here. Okay, thank you. All right, so this concludes our sixth one. Do I have questions or comments from the board for Joe or Carl? regarding the budget at this point? Courtney? To backtrack a little bit, going back to sort of talking about program highlights and, and our school, we're a really small school, as we know. Um, and yet, what I believe is that there, all the state requirements are still, are the same for us, whether we have 200 students or 2,000 students. Um, Carl, can you just speak a little bit about our administrative staff, um, has, how has that changed over uh, the last 
it, the last several years, I believe we have had a superintendent and a principal uh, running the building and the district uh, for many years. Has there been an increase? Um, how, how does that play in with state requirements? Uh, Courtney, there, there really has been no increase in the number of staff. Um, in fact, this year we are decreasing one, um, our director of facilities and transportation position that, that was not filled um, and the responsibilities redistributed. Um, we did some restructuring our, in our business office. So one example, uh, there were always three uh, employees in the business office, the business official, accounts payable, and a payroll person. Um, <clears throat> we did last year, uh, as you will recall, uh, abolish the, the accounts payable position and create a treasurer position. Um, but the reason uh, for this was to be in compliance um, with, with state protocol. Um, you know, the Roslyn um, case uh, back in the early 2000s, um, you know, caused um, everyone to take a closer look and state ed to take a closer look at controls and to make sure there was separation of responsibilities within business offices. So our auditors um, did um, recommend to us and we took that recommendation um, <clears throat> to create a treasurer. Uh, and Joe can speak to the details of it, but that, that is one, but again, there were three people. There are currently three people. There was no overall increase there. Um, as far as um, the principal and the superintendent and the business official that always existed, uh, and as I said earlier, in response to, I think it was Kent's question, the technology position that exists right now was a teacher on special assignment. So there was one person dedicated to technology. So there really is no overall increase. In fact, there's, there's an overall decrease uh, when you look at the, that facilities and transportation position. Thank you. Sure. Um, before I move on, I also have a statement from Madeline that she'd asked me to read, unless I have any other questions, comment, or thoughts, okay. Okay. Um, she apologizes that she couldn't be here. Um, in her absence, she would like to express her support for the budget of $12.3 million with the recommended 10% levy increase. She would like to thank Carl and Joe for answering all of our endless questions in the last couple of weeks and for diligently advocating on the district's behalf to local politicians and for continuing to negotiate fees which did cut approximately 300,000 from the original budget draft. Um, it's not Madeline's words, but I will point out that Haldane did give us a break on special education costs for this year, and we greatly appreciate them reconsidering those costs. Um, and that O'Neill also reduced their fees for students attending technical education. And combined, that's about 300,000, correct, Joe? Um, back to Madeline's statements, but most importantly, without impacting the students' quality of education. She would also like to thank the public for attending and participating in budget discussions and recommends that those who have questions attend upcoming discussions. So that's, I wanted to put that out there for Madeline. Jocelyn, did you have a question or comment that you yeah, wanted to add? Kind of like a comment. And Dusty, if you can go back to the slide, like 10 back that has the, the red. You don't have to move, guys. You guys have been way in the wings the whole time. Come on. <laughs> it has the red numbers. The increase is not within the district's control. Increases not within the district. 63. Where are their numbers? Oh, I'm on the Technology. page. Yeah. Okay. So what I wanted to just point out, because I keep learning something new every time I watch this, which I truly appreciate um, all of the work you guys have done. So it's my understanding that, for example, last year when we voted on the budget and it was voted yes, we voted to increase our own taxes by about 2% last year, right? And we probably have done that previously as we vote to approve our budget. So this year we're asking our community to increase it by more than 2%, by 10%, right? And if we look at all these red numbers, when they add up to 762,000, and you take 1% is 97,000, that's the extra 8%. I mean, it's just really so clear that in order to handle these costs that are really not in our control. Um, we have to ask our community and ourselves, those of us who are, who are in this community, to really to go beyond the 2% we would have maybe, quote unquote, normally done to ourselves and 
and increase our own taxes by that much more. And that's a really heavy lift. But I, I swear, the more and more I see these numbers, I'm just thinking that it really is one of the only ways for us to maintain like the fiscal solvency of our district. So I appreciate it. I can't believe how much it dawns on me every time, little new bits. And so that's what I kind of took away from this slide. Like this is the 8% on top of the normal two. percent is, is, is basically here um, in order to balance the, the current budget that we're, we're in now due to the, the surprise of the change in, in tuition rate in last March you know we made the decision for to, to build the 21-22 um, budget using fund balance and you know that was a conscious decision um, we don't have um, additional fund balance that is is available to do that for next year's budget. We, we did go to the, the rainy day fund for, yeah. to support the current year that we're in. So we, we, we don't have that option to support next year. And since the, the revenue is determined by, by the tax cap and we can only raise 200,000 with the cap, this is where the rest of it is. Yeah. yeah. David? really for both Carl and Joe. Um, what, what would you say to people in the community who look at this and say, okay, you want 10% this year. Uh, give you 10% this year. What's going what's to keep you from using this as a precedent so that next year or the year after you come back and ask us for another 10%? I mean, how, much, how, much, how comfortable are we that for the foreseeable future anyway, this, this override will give us the stability so that we don't have to keep going back to, to taxpayers and ask for more year after year? I, I think this, this helps, but one of the things that would, would really help us is if we are able to get um, longer term contracts for, for tuition for the two, two high schools that, that are predictable. I think that that, um, that together with this override would would uh, foresee us um, much better for the for the future. Right? We we are still um, actively pursuing and um, trying to put in place uh, things that will make it more stable and predictable for for the years to come. David, I, I would just add to that 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 is an important question that you you've posed, and others have posed the same question. And my response has been consistent. We, we really can't make an, any guarantees for the future. Um, you know, I, Joe did a great job of explaining this inflation situation that we're in and why this tax cap formula did work from 2012, you know, up until last year. Uh, it's, it's still working for other districts because of, of the influx of state aid that, that nearly everyone received. We did not, we lost state aid. So, when someone poses that question, it, it is a concern for me, and I want to be honest with, with the board and the community that inflation will persist. And, and you know, turn on any, any business um, station or pick up the, world, you know, the Wall Street Journal and, and you will hear uh, the Fed chairman and, and, and Federal Reserve Bank, this is a major concern for our country. Um, Inflation seeps into everything that we do, um, whether it's healthcare, transportation, gas expenses, um, everything. So there was a time, and Joe and I do remember this in the early 2000s, where, where four, five, six percent tax rate increases were, were pretty typical. Um, I hope we don't go back to that, but I think if, if you have consistent inflation you know, inflation rates somewhere in that seven, eight percent range. Uh, eventually, I think it's going to force districts uh, to pierce the tax cap, um, and it could hit Garrison again. However, I, I, I will say, and, and again, we, we can't say with 100 percent certainty, but I think a 10 percent override at least protects us two, hopefully three years out. I'll just follow up my last thoughts on this before we move on. I know Ken has some too. Um, 
what we're really looking to do here is preserve the educational program we've put in place. And I think it makes us competitive with our neighboring districts. We could eliminate the arts. We could eliminate more teaching positions. We can eliminate debate. We could eliminate STEAM. These are all offerings that our neighboring districts have. And I think to remove a lot of program, you know, is this a place people want to move to? Is this a place people want to live if we do that to our school district? And that's my big question, because I look at what our neighboring school districts offer, and all those programs are in there. Um, I do think, we, though, we have to be mindful of costs going forward, and that's why we take advantage of programs like the Artists in Residence, where we can for things like music. Um, and we have to continue along that. When teachers leave, do we need to really evaluate, do we need that position going forward, which I think we've done in this budget as well. Those are my parting thoughts on this. Kent? Thank you. So I just want to address the community, since you guys have been so patient. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I did want to make a quick statement, and I'll try to make it quick. Uh, I, think, I think it's important to articulate a few things before we hear your comments, because unfortunately, this forum is not ideal. Uh, we, we can't answer questions. We can't go back and forth. And, and uh, so I just wanted to say a few things. I've lived in this community over 16 years. I've sent my three kids here for the last nine years. I love this school. My kids love this school. Um, they're going to be well prepared and have a great foundation for high school, college, and life going forward. When I joined this month board about 10 months ago, people said to me, you're crazy. And I imagine they were thinking of times like this, um, moments like this. But it's a moment like this is why I wanted to join the board. Uh, the school and community are really at a turning point. The budget that you've seen tonight is one that reflects the challenging situation we're in. We didn't pick 10% irresponsibly or randomly. We picked it for a reason. It's what we need. It's the number that will help us continue to fund the school as the community has grown accustomed and to keep us from going to financial distress. Now, as we've seen in the presentation, much of the situation the need that has been dictated is, is factors beyond our control. The simple truth is we've decreased our spending where we could. And trust me when I tell you, from an insider's point of view, this school is being run very efficiently. These guys are professionals. They know what they're doing. At times, I feel like this process over the last couple of months has been like that movie Dave, where the non-politician comes in and is the president, and he goes through and tries to cut the budget with, with crazy ideas. And there have been a lot of crazy ideas that have come across the transom here. Creative, really creative questions to Joe and Carl about how to save money and help the cause, and we appreciate that. But unfortunately, unlike that movie, there is no aha moment here. There's no magic pill that's going to save this situation and, and prevent us from making tough choices. Our budget questions and the challenges that we have are often limited by the mandates that we have from the state and the government. And that's something I've certainly learned over the last 10 months. You, you don't have free reign to run this like you run a business. I can understand the reaction to this 10% tax increase. I have the same reaction. Uh, I looked at these guys like they were crazy. That's too much, I thought. And, and that's an easy thing to, to think about when you don't know the details of the situation. You know, I, I get it. Inflation is real. We all know that. Gas prices are unbelievable. Food prices make you do a double take. take. Um, everything costs more. But right now, there just isn't a workaround to this. After this research and examination, it's clear. It's, it's not if we're going to do a tax increase. It's when we're going to do a tax increase. And that leaves us a choice. And we, you know, without this override, we're going to have to fundamentally change the educational experience of the school. Nobody will be spared. We can't cut our way out of this and maintain the experience. So I think this investment in our teachers, our students, and our community is well worth it. I've seen the message boards. I've gotten emails. I know there are some very vocal opponents, opponents of the tax hike. There's been a lot of questioning things that have happened in the past, the way we spent money on things like COVID. And I wasn't a board member then, but I was a parent. And I have to say, I'm really proud of the outcome of what happened in this community. This school was open when the, the entire country was pretty much shut down. Our kids have thrived thanks to that. For those that weren't ready to come back, we were able to accommodate them. We were able to accommodate our teachers with iTutor. And, and we did spend money to do that, but I think it was well worth that investment given what we knew at the time. There were so many unknowns, and our teachers our administration, they navigated a path to success. And it's because we were financially stable at the time that we were able to, to spend that money and do the things that we had to do to put them in this situation to succeed. 
I mean, now we're, and now we're in another challenging time. Simply put, this budget and tax hide is what we need to do to stay on course. And we had the discussion, will we ever have to do it again? I'm a firm believer, and you have my word, that I'm going to work to not come back to the community. We have to figure out how to live within our means, but we do need this help to get through this situation. <clears throat> there will be cuts in the future, even if there's an override. We have to figure out how to get this under control. <clears throat> but I urge the community, when you talk about cuts, to think about the impact of those cuts. I certainly do. Every cut we do disrupts a kid, disrupts teachers, parents, and families in our community. None of them are unimportant. Everybody, it means something to everybody that you make a cut with. If we support this tax site, we can, we can minimize, minimize those disruptions and keep ourselves on this upward track. This school's in great shape. That's great for our students, our teachers, and our families, and most of all, our community. So I ask that Garrison trust this board, trust the administration, and trust that our ask for this sacrifice and this override is the right thing to do. Thank you again for coming out tonight. Matt, did you want to? Seconded. Okay. Um, he didn't write his own. He just wanted to second <laughs> yours there. Okay. So unless I have further thoughts or comments from the board at this point in the evening, I'm going to continue on our agenda. Um, that brings us to public comment. We did move public comment up a little bit for this evening. Um, and we will have two public comment sections again. Public comment is intended for members of the community to speak openly and voice concerns. In accordance with policy 3220 of the Garrison Union Free School District, any person wishing to speak shall comply with all provisions of this policy. Comments about specific school personnel or individual students is a violation of board policy. Concerns regarding students or personnel <clears throat> should be discussed privately with the superintendent or appropriate administrator. Speakers are asked to conduct themselves in a respectful manner. The board will listen to comments but will not engage in dialogue. Any necessary follow-up will be noted and provided through the appropriate channel. I have a sign-up list here. So first I'm going to invite, we, not to the podium today, but to this microphone, uh, Ms. Amy Kuchera, the president of the GTA, please. Good evening, my name is Amy Kuchera. Tonight I speak on behalf of the Garrison Teachers Association as the co-president. We would like to express to the board and to the community that we are in support of tonight's proposed budget, uh, which allows the continuation of high quality programs, initiatives, and instruction at our school. We would like to impress upon the community that to continue to maintain the high quality of the student experience here, next year's budget must retain all of the current personnel employed by the district. As you know, the teaching faculty work to create a highly engaging educational learning environment. And it's easy to overlook the fact that the student's learning environment is also supported by our school-related professionals who work in the classrooms and around the school every day. Together with the custodians, the teacher aides, and the office staff, we are able to create the exceptional experiences we all expect for the children of our community. <clears throat> we recognize that we are facing an unprecedented situation this year. Please know that we are here to work with the board, with the administration, and with the community to ensure that Garrison School continues to thrive and remains a place where students love to learn. We, the members of the Garrison Teachers Association, respect the challenges that creating this budget has presented, and we appreciate the community's support of this budget for the 2022-2023 school year. Thank you. Thank you. Next I have Mr. Ned Rausch, the PTA. Good evening, everybody. Ned Rausch from the uh, PTA, although I'm here speaking on, uh, for myself, not on behalf of our organization. Um, I've got a daughter in first grade and a, and a, and a son coming into kindergarten next year. Um, I'm here to thank the, the board and the administration for their work on the uh, on this budget and, and thank to the faculty and staff who have, uh, you guys have been out here at each of these meetings. You, they, they, they care about this community, they care about this school, they care about these kids and they do a great job. Um, I, I just want to offer my support for this budget. Um, 
in the face of surging inflation and unprecedented costs dealing with the pandemic, um, you have, have figured out a way to hold the line wherever you can. You've made it clear that there are places that you, you can't, but where you can, you have. And um, I, I appreciate that. I commend you for that. Um, Carl, I want to thank you for emphasizing um, the importance of the arts, the importance of, of environmental ed education, and the implementation of the strategic plan, which we all worked so hard on. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that, will, that, that, that make this school and all the rest of the academic program, of course, such a wonderful place for our kids, and we need to preserve that. We need to do what we can. We need to pay for that, and I, and I appreciate that. Um, without this override, our kids, our community will suffer. Our school will suffer. Um, and uh, I just, I, I support it. I think we need, we need to do it. And, 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 and I would just add, it's really strange to find ourselves in a, a position where we're a community too wealthy to receive um, aid from the state, but too poor to afford a bus route. You know, that, that, seems, that seems crazy to me. So um, thank you for your work. I support this budget. Let's, uh, you know, preserve our school. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Mr. Eric Arnold. Hi, everybody. I'm Eric Arnold, a, a parent of a first grader and a preschooler who's um, coming into the school eventually. Um, I'm going to veer off course a little bit, um, but I want to start by thanking the board um, for an, an agenda item you have on your next meeting, which is taking up uh, the non-resident tuition um, discussion um, and really making a giant leap forward on that front. Um, my family and I previously lived on the other side of the line, in the, just over in the Lakeland District, and, and this is something I approached the board about six years ago and, um, and was pretty consistently rebuffed by um, a couple of previous members of the board who, um, as I should note, didn't, uh, in particular, the, the two that really pushed back the hardest didn't have kids in the school at the time, and uh, unlike the board today. Um, and one of the board members who, at the time, who did have uh, kids in the school and was really trying his hardest on behalf of the, the teachers and the students, um, I remember I ran into him on the train one night and he, and he said to me, you know, why do you want your kids at Guff's? You know, the school's just not as good as it could be. And I told him that, you know, I, is, I, I really wanted to invest in our kids' future and we wanted to invest in the future of the community. And this school is you know, really at the heart of the community. And um, you know, back then, that same board member told me that the school was really having a hard time um, retaining its best teachers, and it was really having a hard time uh, attracting uh, new teacher talent. And, you know, I now realize, based on my experience uh, from back then, that, you know, that some of those, uh, you know, previous board members, and this is, this is my opinion, I would say, um, you know, their inaction on something so simple as non-resident tuition, you know, really, it impressed upon me that, they viewed any change in the status quo as an assault on their low tax rate. And, um, you know, I would argue that some of those board members weren't necessarily uh, planning for the future with sensible cuts or strategic planning uh, uh, here and there. And, you know, I'm not really sure that they were acting out of best interest uh, uh, for the kids. So now I want to fast forward to about two years ago, and we suddenly had a board, uh, everybody with, with, with kids in the school, um, they brought us a competent and talented and dedicated superintendent and principal. Good teachers stayed. All of a sudden, good teachers were coming into open positions that had been vacant for months. Um, and, you know, one of the board members who sits here now, just remain nameless, when he was running for re-election a couple of years ago, I remember this quote in the paper. He said, you know, we had a good school. Now we have a great school. And you guys are the reason why. And the superintendent, the principal, and the teachers are the reason why. And, you know, regard, and so now to move into this tax cap override, we all have to pay for things that we don't want to. You know, I, I pay for Social Security that I'll never see. I pay for other people's health care. I pay for the senior senator. I, I pay for dirt road maintenance. You know, it's, you know, we all pay for things that we don't necessarily want to, but it's, it's part of living in a healthy, vibrant community. I, you know, I don't want to raise my own taxes, but I'm very happily and enthusiastically going to vote yes when this comes uh, to a vote, because the alternative just is not good for the kids, it's not good for the teachers, it's not good for the community, and it's not good for our home values, which I should note have all gone up 20, 30% in the last two years. So 
um, now having said that, if you're opposed to the tax increase, I, I hear you. Um, but I think it's misguided to blame the dedicated and thoughtful board, staff, teachers, everybody sitting here tonight doing everything they can to keep this school a beacon of our community. You know, an extra 40 or $80 a month, it is going to be hard for some people, and there's no denying that. And, you know, some people are going to have to make choices between cutting the cord on cable or maybe not having a nice dinner out, maybe some even tougher choices, gas, food, as, as Ken pointed out. You know, but given the choice between the future of our kids and the teachers here, I will choose them over any luxury, any time, 100 times out of 100. So, uh, you know, the board, the staff, the teachers, you guys have all, the superintendent, the principal, you guys have all worked so hard to make this a great school. And I'm really going to enthusiastically vote yes um, to the budget to, to keep it that way. So thank you to all of you. Thank you. Next, I have Barbara. I'm sorry, I don't want to miss. If you could say your last, I just don't want to mispronounce yeah, it for you. Barbara Scuchamara. Scuchamara, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, thank you for all your hard work. Oh, oh, you turn the mic down. There you go. Sorry. It's maybe you should be able to touch it. I have lived in Garrison for 50 years. I can't believe that. I have had two children go through Garrison School. My son is now a teacher in Carmel, so I can relate to the teachers here as well. My concern is for the seniors in our community. I know you have put a lot of hard work into this, and I appreciate everything you've done, and the thoughtfulness, and you really care about your students. This school has always been a wonderful school. But I'm concerned with the senior center, seniors in our community that want to stay in their homes, that are on fixed incomes, that are retired, that are having a difficult time right now. We know our economy is not doing well. The price of gas, the price of home heating oil. I don't know about you, but Central Hudson Bill is always a real surprise now. So I am hoping that you'll consider maybe a 5% increase. I know the worst case scenario on this possible contingent budgets are these that are listed. I just think that if we go back to the drawing board and find some other cuts, so it won't, because you can't guarantee what's gonna happen next year, especially in this volatile economy that we have right now, we may be facing a recession in the next few years. So what does that mean to the residents that really want to stay in this community. And I don't want to take away from the kids, and I do appreciate everything you've done, but I really would wish you would consider. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Lauren Benares. Hi, thank you so much for all of these that you have repeatedly given over and over, you've given so many opportunities for all of us to really thoroughly understand what's going on, which I personally appreciate so very much, especially because this stuff is really not intuitive for me at all. And I, I don't, this is not the kind of thing where I can, you know, look at a presentation like this or even watch this just once and really understand what's going on, but you've given so many opportunities that now I actually finally, <laughs> feel like I understand it, and that is so important. Um, I strongly support this budget. I think that the benefits of a tax cap override far outweigh the costs, and everything, you know, everything has a cost and everything has a benefit, so certainly I'm not diminishing the costs, but next to the benefits, it's, for me, not even a question. Um, especially because virtually none of the big cost drivers for it are within the school's control. Over 40, if I'm understanding it right, over 40% of this budget is items that we have no control over whatsoever, that are not negotiable, that are not something you can kind of tweak and cut here and there. It's like the bills, the bills that have to be paid. And I just want to reiterate that the shortfall does not have to do with irresponsible, irresponsible spending. It doesn't have to do with excessive programming or programming that's sort of peripheral and nice to have but not necessary. It's the programming that our schools should have, that schools around us do have, that keep us 
a decent competitive school as opposed to one that, you know, it, we're not going for the lowest common denominator. Um, I, I think that um, a, a big roadblock in people's understanding of it and support of it has to do a lot with language and, um, and what 10% means. Because <laughs> 10% is a number, but it's, an, it's a number that, I'll speak for me personally, it means nothing. It's like, it sounds huge, it sounds big, but it also, in my mind, because I don't, you know, I, this is not my area of great understanding, when I see the numbers, as opposed to it just being termed 10%, when I see that our school tax rate would change from a very low 9.75% to another really low 10.72%, that to me sounds very reasonable <laughs> in a way that the term 10% simply does not. So that when I read you know, a headline from the Highland Current that says Garrison's weighing a 10% tax hike, and it's a, I, people like me think things like 10% tax hike over 9% becomes 19%, which obviously it doesn't, but this is not intuitive stuff. And I think that when you look at it, when you can break it down even in communications with, uh, with people, certainly I plan on writing you know, some letters to the editor, 10% um, is a space holder for people in their mind that is that means something more than just 10%. So um, I, I don't know for whatever for whatever that's worth. I would I'm going to try to be clearer in that in my own communication, and I think it's probably a good idea for a lot of us to be clearer in that because it's not stuff that's easily understood. Um, I think the staff that you gave and that uh, Grady, another parent, also informed me about that. Even with this tax cap override, we are 82 out of 84 schools with the lowest tax rate. That's a, our taxes are quite low. I'm not saying that it's easy to pay low taxes or it's easy to increase anything, but I think that's an incredibly reasonable ask. And I also wanna just thank you all for everything that you've done over the last two years. I know that maybe not, you know, not everyone in, in the Garrison community has children in the school or has had children go through the school. This school, for definitely for my family and for pretty much every family I know that's in this school, was the glue of the community. It was what kept, it, it kept things from sort of imploding, at least for my family and I know for sure for a lot of other families. So now we're asking for some community aid, some community support. It's not an unreasonable ask. And I personally feel like it's, it's very reasonable. And I support it. OK. Bye. Thank you. Linda Lominaro, please. OK. Thank you. Anita Prentice. I'm going to go with the um, Matt Spicer. Um, I'm here to. Um, say I support the budget and great presentation and good luck. <laughs> Thank you. You couldn't hear me? <laughs> I support the budget. The 10% increase. <laughs> Shouted from the streets. Okay. Grady Oaks, please. Thank you. Uh, maybe a broken record here, but I, I do want to say I, I really appreciate um, you hear it in the questions. You are paying attention to the community. You're on every. Um, we all know there's like two. There's two town threads. There's uh, Phillips Town Locals where we keep it light, and then there's the neighbors where we act like real neighbors and peek over each other's uh, fences and 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 sling around a lot of mud. Um, and, and to that end, like, I do want to say why, why I appreciate the candor of that conversation. Like, I'm, ash I'm ashamed of some of it, and I apologize to members of our faculty and um, of the leadership of our school for a bunch of the really vile and nasty things that get said. Um, and I don't think that's a reflection on who we aspire to be as a community. I, I, I moved here, uh, I used to come visit here from the city. I moved here four years ago and I came here for two things. My buddy told me that there was a really good golf course and that the school was pretty good. And 
I'm really excited to play the Highlands this summer. Um, you know, but, um, you know, this, I, I, where I went to school, I went to a public school in Texas. And, um, you know, in Texas, we fund our schools with um, local taxes, but then we also fund it with, with oil, oil revenue, right? There's a bunch of uh, oil revenue that the state uses to, to finance public education. But when we walked into my public school, uh, there was a quote, you know, on the top of the building, and it said, the spirit of a people is disclosed by the education of their youth. And um, how we invest in this community, I think, makes a difference. Like, for sure, you have a moral obligate or a moral right to keep your income that you earn. I understand that. I think we also have a moral obligation to support our school. And I hear a lot of people talking about, like, well, what happens if we don't fund this? What happens with... Um, what does this mean about it being a place where people want to live? Well, again, I think between the Highlands and uh, the Shakespeare Festival and the Fjord Trail and all kinds of really snazzy things, this will always be a place that people want to live because it's so beautiful. What I'm more worried about right now is, is this going to be a place where people want to teach? Because if this is a community that doesn't support its school, when you can put it up there black and white that says this is what's going to happen, and if you don't support this budget, that we will fray the fabric of this community because you'll lose school choice. And you can't go down the street to the high school and you can't have that connective tissue and uh, that we're gonna cut more teachers because that is what's gonna happen. I just don't see how really anyone in the community could um, not wanna find a way to dig deep on this one. So I appreciate the effort. I know how hard this has been. I really get it. I know like the work's not done and it'll keep going and you'll be up to your elbows uh, Next year, Joe, you're getting really, really good at that presentation. Uh, you're a pro, but um, thank you. Appreciate the help. Thanks. Thank you. James Hoke? Yes, you're the next on my list. Hi. I said I was never coming back here. So um, I, I joined the board about eight years ago. I served six years. That was my tour of duty. I had two tours. I survived. Um, when I joined the board, the business manager at the time put up a graph that showed this day was coming. And uh, there's only so much reserves you can use to offset your expenses. We knew this was coming. Uh, we argued whether it made sense to, to uh, go, go for a tax ride uh, earlier. And the, uh, and the sensibility of the board then was if we have the money, it is the wrong thing to do to ask for an override when you have the money. I don't think there's anything anybody could predict it about the pandemic, but one of the things we could predict is that we had the money to keep the school open and deliver a safe online education. The district at the time was morally obligated to commit those funds for that purpose. They couldn't say no when they had the cash. It'd be wrong to do that. So here we are, you know, dealing with the very question that was proposed to us that, or that was pointed out was that there was no way to avoid this. It was going to happen just simply by the structure of it. Um, I don't envy you guys being on the board. I'm kind of glad I left when I did. Um, so, but one of the things that happened was that, you know, uh, uh, lived here 10 years and never had to go, go for the override, that means my taxes have remained artificially low. That is to say, we've been using reserves to hide the fact that we should have been paying more. So our taxes are artificially low. They don't represent the expense of this building, the expense of our, our lives. They just don't. We just happen to have reserves that we could say, no, it's, it's really this much. It's really this much. It's never been that much. We've always used reserves to cushion the impact upon the community. So in so doing, uh, we got everyone grown accustomed to the 2%, the 2%, the 2%. I'd hear nightmare scenarios about four one year, six another year, eight one year, one one year, up and down, up and down. Everyone got accustomed to that normalcy. But that was an artificial sense of normalcy. It wasn't the actual true cost of running the school. We just happened to have reserves to satisfy that. Um, one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that got deferred was the maintenance of the school. And I don't mean the capital project, I mean the general maintenance of the school. Uh, 
The physical plant, improvements to the physical plant were deferred. Improvements to the human resources were deferred. And I would say somewhat to the educational mission of the school, that got deferred. And as, as the board and as the district decided to commit themselves to improving the physical plant, supporting the human resources, its teachers and administration, and purposing themselves toward an educational mission through strategic planning and identifying what priorities existed, it was abundantly clear that um, when confronted with the pandemic that the current, that staying within the tax cap was unsustainable. So we knew it was coming and it came, and yet we were able to improve the school in the process and deliver it. So what does it mean for me? For me, it means that the 10% is the difference between you asking me for, uh, I pay $5,000 a year in school taxes. You're gonna ask me for 45 cents, but now you're asking me for $1.35 roughly a day. Can I afford to give the school $1.35 a day? I think I can. I think I can. And I think if someone's on a restricted income, I totally understand it, but that was an art you're living at an artificial level when considering the tax cuts and, or the tax cap. So it's time to be real with people and be real about the, um, the purpose and the function and the ambition of the school. And I think that by being real, and I think we've all been doing a really great job of being real, we're able to receive this information and make informed decisions about what's at stake. And I think you've done it and I support this particular budget because it, it, it reckons with the reality that, that the school is in. And the, the reality is very positive. And you don't want to diminish that for the sake of protecting an artificial level of tax levy. That's it. Thank you. We are still in public comment. If anyone did not sign up earlier and now wishes to come speak or sign up, you are invited to, please. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on then in the interest of time. Um, and we will now all leave the building. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a long day for, for us. Yes. So. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to the adoption of the proposed budget for the 2022-2023 school year and approval of the pro property tax report card. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read the recommended action first. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Garrison Union Free School District hereby adopts a budget of $12,000,000 364,242 for school district purposes for the school year commencing on July 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2023 to be presented for voter consideration at the annual meeting of May 17th, 2022. And be it further resolved that the board hereby approves the 2022-2023 property tax report card as presented. May I have a motion please? So moved. Okay. Do I have any further comments or questions from the board at this point before we move to a vote? And Dusty, we're gonna do a roll call. Anything else? I just wanna say I appreciate the public for coming out and I hope you continue to share your thoughts. If you have questions or concerns, um, please, Joe and Carl are available for meetings. Um, and we do really appreciate hearing from everyone regardless of whether your support is with this or not, or if you have other questions. So please come forward if you have anything else you wanna say. Um, I do believe in the 10% is the right number for a levy increase. I also wanna to continue to point out that it's a levy increase. It's not an individual tax hike to tax bills. It's what we need to fund the school. It's a levy we need to fund our education. So any other comments, questions, thoughts? Okay, Dusty, can we have a roll call vote, please? Jocelyn Apicello. Aye. David Gelber. Aye. Courtney McCarthy. Aye. Kent Schott. Aye. Matthew Spicer. Aye. Sarah Tormey. Aye. Thank you. 
We will now move on to approval of proposition to appear on the ballot at the annual meeting of May 17, 2022. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Garrison Union Free School District hereby authorizes the following proposition to be placed on the ballot for voter consideration at the annual meeting of the district on May 17th, 2022. Proposition. Shall the Board of Education of the Garrison Union Free School District be authorized to contract for a period of not less than two and not more than five years with the Highland Falls Fort Montgomery Central School District for the purpose of educating Garrison students in grades nine through 12 and to provide the necessary transportation for such students. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Carl, can you explain this one a little bit? Sure. Uh, this recommendation is so we would be able to enter into um, a three to five year contract with the Highland Falls Fort Montgomery School District for high school tuition. Um, we, I want to be clear, we do not have a firm commitment from the Highland Falls School District. Um, however, we, we do have a proposal. I'll wait for a moment. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just repeat the last part. <clears throat> right now, this evening, we do not have a firm commitment from the Highland Falls Fort Montgomery School District to enter into a multi-year uh, tuition contract. However, we, we are very hopeful, uh, and we've made a proposal to both uh, districts, Haldane and Highland Falls, uh, to agree to a multi-year contract that goes up uh, at the rate of 2% or the CPI, whichever is less. That would mirror the, the tax cap formula um, that, that we um, have right here in New York State. So um, this proposal has been made and Highland Falls uh, administration is very receptive Although no decision is made, we need to approve this this evening, so this could appear on the May 17th ballot. If our proposal is rejected by the Highland Falls District, we simply will not place this on the ballot. However, if we don't approve it this evening, then we lose that opportunity because there, there needs to be two legal notices uh, between now and the May 17th vote. So therefore, we are... Re Is that just going in? Like, we can't change this is the grammar, grammar, right? From our lawyers. The, yeah, I know, this, and I'm just wanting to make sure that this means this is what is showing up on the ballot. No yes, changes. this is the exact language that will appear on the ballot. Uh, again, if Highland Falls agrees to our proposal, and uh, this was given to us by uh, mm -hmm. our, our school attorney. And, and to be very clear for the community, this is not a vote on school choice. This is simply entering in to create an agreement with Highland Falls for a set contract, which we'll try to do the same with Haldane. Yeah. Kent, that, that is 100% correct, and, and I'll add to that, you know, this, this will help us control and be able to predict cost um, five years into the future. So that is the goal. You know, we, we, we've heard from, from the public, um, there is a lot of support for a 10% override, but we're also hearing people asking us to control cost, and uh, this proposition, um, again, if Highland Falls agrees, this would help us to have predictable cost five years into the future. And this doesn't preclude us from entering into an agreement with Haldane at any point in the future if that becomes a possibility, correct? That is correct. All right, any other questions, comments, or thoughts on this resolution as presented? Okay, I'm going to move to a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Nays, abstentions, thank you. Um, we are now at 10 o'clock in the evening reaching President's remarks. I have no further comment this evening. Thank you all for still being here. Uh, Carl. I have two very brief comments. Um, the first is uh, last board meeting we adopted a district calendar uh, that starts uh, student school year um, early on August 31st and I've received quite a bit of feedback uh, from parents who have asked us to revisit that um, and potentially uh, start the school year after Labor Day. Uh, so I just want to let the public know and the board that um, we are looking 
uh, at a way to maybe restructure next year's calendar, meet all our required days uh, and contractual obligations, um, but also postpone the uh, beginning of the school year. So uh, hopefully I'll have an update for you at our next meeting. Secondly, uh, Eric uh, Wilson did mention this. There's asbestos abatement next week, spring break. So we hope everybody has a restful and, and, and enjoyable vacation. The administrative staff does work at least part of the week, but we won't be on site. Uh, we will be working remotely. We will check our emails, especially if there are questions pertaining to the budget. Uh, the Monday that we return uh, is on, on April 18th is not a student day, but it is a professional development day. I just wanna thank Allison Amig and Mike Simertano for putting together uh, a fantastic uh, PD calendar. Both of them are actually um, providing professional development. Uh, the topics include DEI, communications, uh, reading and math instruction, and uh, that should be a very productive day with our staff, so we look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Do I have any questions for Carl regarding, okay. Um, moving on to accept the minutes. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Garrison Union Free School District does hereby accept the minutes of the regular meeting of of March 16th, 2022, and the minutes of the special meeting of March 30th, 2022. May I have a motion, please? Second. It can be louder, okay. Uh, any questions or comments on the minutes, please? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Nays. Abstentions. We now move on to new business. <clears throat> okay. Be it resolved, the Board of Education of the Garrison Union Free School District hereby approves the new business items as presented. May I have a motion, please? Second. Okay. Does anyone have any questions before we move on on the new business items here? We have some CSE recommendations and then the rest of these. I'm going to get to, um, we have some change orders. We also have a first reading of a policy, so let's separate that out first. So if you have any questions on the change orders or the CSE? None? These, oh. change, these are just the change orders from earlier. Yes. These are the change orders They're from earlier. Them. So then I'm going to go to Courtney, the head of our policy committee, who's going to speak very loudly into the microphone regarding the first reading of policy 31, or 7131, non-resident tuition. Courtney? Thank you. I think otherwise known as the Eric Arnold non-resident tuition uh, student policy. Um, it was actually really great to hear from Eric to go back through history that of something that we have been considering for several years um, and always sort of struggled to put into place. Non-resident tuition uh, means the possibility of accepting uh, students that do not reside in garrison um, who would pay a uh, set amount, the not, uh, tuition, um, to our school. That would uh, potentially generate revenue for the school, which is certainly something, as we learned tonight, would help. Um, and, uh, and possibly even round out some, some of the smaller classes if it works out that way. Uh, we went through, we've gone through a lot of details, um, hopefully uh, prepared for any potential um, issues that could come up with it. Uh, all the details are in the policy. I hope you've reviewed it. Um, happy to answer any questions. Um, Sarah, Jocelyn on the policy committee, anything else to add to that? I think it's just important to note that in this policy, um, we clearly define that we would accept students as long as it does not require us to add another teacher. Um, so that means, for example, next year we have some room possibly in the two sections of kindergarten. Those will be 14 each. So should we have a family who does not reside in garrison, they could tuition in. Um, I think the second thing to really point out is we haven't set a rate yet. I believe, Joe, and correct me if I'm wrong, the state rate for garrison is 32000 for the NRT rate. We can set whatever rate. We can go to 32, we can go below that, that we want um, to make it feasible. We would look to set that rate in the reorg meeting in July, or we could set it when we do finalize this policy. Is that correct? You, you could do it earlier, yes. I, I think you know, maybe, maybe because this is the first time, I would recommend um, maybe at our June meeting 
in case there are parents interested for September. And then maybe every year going forward, we'll just make it part of the reorg meeting. I also think it's important to point out that we will not provide transportation for any non-resident students to attend the school. They would have to provide their own transportation, so that would not impact our transportation line items in the budget. There is criteria that is listed in the policy, including screenings, um, academic performance, um, that are also in there as well. This also, one of the things, I'm sorry, I joined this board to talk about policies. You're gonna have to bear with me. I don't care really, it's 10 o'clock at night now. Um, I know, <laughs> I'm so, you know, you have to teach in the morning, but this is the part I was so excited about. Um, so this allows for, you know, former residents, it clearly defines how their children can remain enrolled. Um, or if you're moving into the district and say you haven't closed on your house um, just yet, or potential future, it's future students uh, who intend to become residents within 30 days, this provides a pathway in for those students to start, say, start the school year on time, even if they haven't closed on their house. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. This is to clarify what a resident is. It means that the student sleeps in the Garrison School District three nights of the week. That is correct. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Felt like a test. Majority of the week. Um. All right, I think that's my excitement on the policies. Anyone have any other questions or thoughts? This is just our first reading. We'll have a second reading next time, right? That's correct. And this is available in board docs for anyone in the public to read if they have any questions or concerns regarding the policy. Okay. Nothing like a policy conversation to get a second wind in the middle of the night. Um, Next on here, we have a request for approval of budget transfer. If, does anyone have any questions regarding the budget transfer? Okay. Then for, let's see, we're all in favor of the new business items. Please say aye. 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 Nays. Abstentions. We now come again to the public comment section. We have two public comment sections, public comment, and I have a sign-in sheet right here. If anyone wishes to come up and speak, you're welcome to. Um, the same rules apply as before. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and keep us going. Uh, we're gonna move to, oh, come up, please, come on up. No, sorry, I don't wanna. I'll just... Delmar Carlin. Uh... I live in Garrison, and I'm a graduate of the school back in the Pleistocene. But it, uh, I just wanted to make one comment about the very last thing you said. Um, the, I guess the IT guy isn't here anymore. But uh, a few days ago, I could go to the website and find things. And now I go and click on things, and it says 404, not available. About the only thing I could find, I, I'm exaggerating. One of the things I could find, of course, is the way to buy T-shirts and things like that. Lots of nice pictures, but I couldn't find, and I could find the schedule for bu budget presentations, but uh, there's something wrong. I mean, it, it was touted very highly tonight, but it certainly wasn't working for me or for my wife. I think that needs to be addressed. I, I bring it up because you just commented about what's available. Uh, I don't, it does not seem to be working, and I think it needs to work. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have anyone else who would like to comment this evening? Okay. I'm gonna go ahead then and move on to uh, board member comment and other discussion. Jocelyn, do you have further comment this evening? David, no comment? Uh, Courtney? Very little. I want to say thank you to all of the teachers and staff. You guys have been here darn near every meeting. Stacy, Ricky, you were here in a snowstorm on a Saturday morning. <laughs> Amy yeah, and Shara. Yeah. Um, so uh, it just shows, this is not part of your job, but uh, it shows your dedication, all everybody's dedication to this school and this community and our kids. And, Thank you. Okay, Kent, any further comment? I uh, just wanted to again thank Joe and Carl 
for the hard work to get us to where we got to tonight and to the board for the really strong engagement in the process. Uh, it, it's been re really well done. Thank you. All right, Matt? I had a chance to say thank you to John Carl for the presentation, so thank you both. And I have no further comment this evening. Um, we are now moving to executive session. Um, be resolved that the Board of Education of the Garrison Union Free School District hereby enters into executive session for the purpose of discussing contract negotiations for the tuition of Garrison students attending high school. Uh, may I have a motion, please? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Nays, abstentions. We will adjourn the meeting without taking any further action this evening. Thank you very much for attending. Everyone, please log out of your computers. Uh -huh.